Good morning, everyone. It is October 17th. It's a Saturday. Thank you for getting on our webinar. We're going to just give everyone a minute or two to get online and then we're going to get started. We have a great day planned for you today. <clears throat> We're just waiting for everyone to get online and uh, we're gonna get started in just about a minute or so. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking time from your Saturday morning to join us. Um, we're glad you're all in town or wherever you are because we know you can't really go anywhere because it's COVID, but uh, anyway, we're so excited for you to spend the morning with us because we have a great program planned for you today. Uh, this is, I think, our 23rd Taste for the Cure, uh, but it is our first virtual Taste for the Cure. And we are not daunted. We're still gonna do our cooking demonstration today. And we have some really fun things for you today. We're gonna to start with our panel, <clears throat> which I'll, who I'll introduce in just one minute. And uh, then we're our, our post-baccalaureate interns who uh, have prepared uh, three minute talks for you just to give you a taste of some of the things that are going on in the program. Uh, we had a fantastic program last week. If you actually didn't get a chance to tune in for that, it is recorded. And you can um, go and uh, get uh, the recording and they're posted online. If you, uh, you can get the resource handout online at Taste for the Cure and we will make today's session uh, posted as well. Um, join via computer audio if you can um, and uh, put your Zoom window in full screen to prepare for the day. And after we have our interns, we're gonna do our cooking demonstration with Allie Mountford, just like we always do. We're very excited to do that for you today. And Ali and I are gonna be cooking in our kitchens and we hope you're gonna be cooking in your kitchen right alongside with us. Um, and then we have a taste for science and we're gonna finish up with our own Nola Hilton who leads our MRI imaging program. And she's gonna to talk to you a little bit about MRI and all the cool things that we're doing with this imaging modality. It's not just a pretty picture, it's much more. And she's gonna tell you how, okay. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to get started um, with our first panel today. And our panel is called Rethinking the Standard, uh, How New Classifications of Tumors Can Improve Cancer Outcomes. So what is it that we mean by that? Um, and I am very excited to tell you that we're joined by um, five, uh, you know, five people today and uh, who have a lot to say about this. And they're gonna introduce themselves as we go through, but we have Sandy Borowski, uh, a pathologist from UC Davis. And these are everyone who's worked together for a long time to make things better for you. Uh, our own medical, uh, breast medical oncologist par excellence, Laura Van Veer, molecular biologist and leader in the development of multi-gene tests. Denise Wolf, who is and Denise, you'll have to explain what a computational biologist is, but she's someone who crunches all the numbers and figures out how, the best way to analyze all the information. And then we have Mike Campbell, who's one of our um, immunologists who's been working with us uh, for many, many years, we won't, we won't uh, say how long, to try and figure out how to optimize immunotherapy. So without further ado, I'm going to start with Sandy Browski, and as I, as each one comes on, they're going to open up their um, 
uh, you'll, you'll get to see them and meet them. So Sandy, introduce yourself a little bit and tell us what you as a breast pathologist do and um, what are the standard markers that are usually reported and what would you prefer instead? <laughs> the last question is the hardest. Uh, so I'm Sandy Borowski. I'm a pathologist, so I'm the doctor that most patients don't ever really meet face to face. Uh, but what I do is still critical to your care. In fact, um, the surgeons like Laura and the radiologists really work for me. They're my hands. Their job is to get me the tissue that I need in order to make a diagnosis and to give the markers that will tell the oncologist how to treat you. So what does that mean in practice? What it means is whenever a biopsy comes into the lab, I have a whole team of technicians who prepare it for me to evaluate. And I look at it under a standard microscope. I've got my microscope right back here. I happen to be in my office this morning. Uh, I have a grant to write later, so you caught me at work. Um, but when I look down um, the eyepieces of the microscope, my job is to, first of all, decide, is this uh, cancer? Is this atypia? Is this normal, um, benign? And, and then, if it is cancer, um, that's sort of when my job really starts. So then I have to evaluate that breast cancer for a lot of different characteristics and markers. And the standard markers, many of you have heard of, is we always evaluate every breast cancer for whether or not it expresses estrogen receptor. And that is a good predictor for response to anti-hormonal therapies. And we evaluate every breast cancer for uh, expression of uh, another gene called HER2 or ERB2. And if the cancer overexpresses HER2 or ERB2, that gives us another therapy um, directed against that specific molecule. The first was trastuzumab. Now we have a series of drugs that target that pathway. And so that's my job is to report those findings to the oncologist so that they can talk to you about decisions and make decisions about therapy going forward. Um, thanks to people like Laura Vanfeer, who you're gonna hear from in a second, and many others, we know a lot more today about how to evaluate a breast cancer. And I, I'm trying to put that into practice in new ways by adding that to the reporting. So what do I mean by that? And, and where are we going with that? Well, we know, for example, that there are cancers that, um, are so very uh, low proliferative rate, so slow growing that they actually have very little chance of affecting you during your lifetime. You know, it's sort of the, the good and the bad of doing a good job with mammography is we detect things very well. We can see smaller and smaller lesions um, on the mammogram, but then when we biopsy them, uh, we sometimes sort of recognize that as a cancer, but a very low risk cancer. And so we found something that maybe um, was not gonna grow to any substantial size and never progress to affect um, you know, your health or your mortality. Um, so these are the things that we're trying to do a, a really good job of identifying. And then on the other side of the coin, there are very um, sort of high risk cancers and we're learning new ways to identify those and we're learning many new uh, markers that um, correspond to a prediction of a response to a whole new series of drugs, including, as Mike Campbell will talk about, uh, the, the new uh, innovative immuno-oncologies helping your immune system attack the tumor. So all of that is in the works and all of that is things that I wanna incorporate in my initial diagnostic report for the whole healthcare team then to make better decisions about how to treat individuals. Well, that's a, that's a great introduction, Sandy. And uh, it's fitting that we're gonna go next to Hope Rugo, <clears throat> who, uh, who often has to take this information. And Hope, why don't you talk a little bit about how you use the information that pathologists like Sandy produce for you and what you're, and what you're really hoping for? Thanks, Laura. And uh, thanks, Sandy, also for that uh, discussion. It's actually an interesting thing. So we evaluate patients as medical oncologists who both have early stage breast cancer, which is our focus today, 
um, and also metastatic disease had spread to other sites. And actually how we evaluate these cancers differ uh, based on whether it's early or late stage. So now we're focusing on patients who are newly diagnosed with a uh, local disease that hasn't spread anywhere. And the first thing that I look at in a biopsy is uh, trying to understand, as Sandy nicely outlined, the aggressiveness of the cancer and the subtype. So what we do is we look at the receptors first, estrogen, progesterone to some degree, and we've struggled for decades to try and understand how important that is, and her 2 new. And it's interesting, during the career of Laura and myself, her 2 new became something that we looked at, and we hadn't looked at it. We knew there was something going on, uh, and it took uh, about a decade to really come into practice and to understand its importance, and now it's a really a critical part of what we do. So ER and PR are assessed in the, uh, in the, by the pathologist, as you heard. And then we get, a, we get a result back that tells us the percent positive of the cells. And what's interesting is we can differentiate zero and positive. And other than that, right now, we're still pretty crummy at understand what those differences are. We know if the estrogen receptor is low, that that often corresponds to a different biology than if it's really high, but differentiating it further it's interesting that we're still really working on that, even though we've understood it for really two and or more decades. Um, having recently reviewed this, it's fascinating. We've changed the way we uh, assessed the estrogen receptor over the last couple of decades, and that may have impacted it. And also there's heterogeneity across the tumor. So you might see one area of the tumor that's very strongly positive for the estrogen receptor and another area that's much less positive. And then HER2 new has been a big challenge for us in terms of how we measure HER2 new. So we look at it in the uh, laboratory the same way we look at the estrogen receptor. But what we understood was there's some variations in the degree of positivity, and that varies as to whether or not it's clinically important. And all of that is changing a little bit now in our trials in the metastatic setting, which we won't talk about, but understanding the positivity, it has taken this huge panel of international pathologists and clinicians, uh, actually a number of tries, and they're still working on it. They made these national, international guidelines. So her 2 new is really important for us because that directs care as does ER. Then we look at grade. And grade is interesting because that's sort of a combination of different factors of looking at the cancer, but there's only three of them. So we know that pathologists can disagree on grade and there can be some variations across the tumor bed. And then lastly, there's a test that we look at called KI67, which is the sort of uh, how fast the cancer uh, is turning over. And there's a lot of variation between different uh, pathologists and how they read that as well. So we've tried to bring all of that together with these uh, gene expression scores that uh, Laura Vantevier has worked on and um, is a, a really made a huge uh, impact on breast cancer by developing one of those scores with their colleagues. Um, and we look at those scores, but we've understood that there can be discordance or differences between all of those pathology factors that we're so used to and these gene scores. So we work with the pathologist to try and understand the heterogeneity uh, in other words, the differences between different parts of the cancer, and also try and understand how we can use that information to best treat the, our patients, offering different types of treatment in different sequences. One thing that's helpful to understand is that the treatment helps us decide on hormone therapy, chemotherapy with or without the HER2-targeted treatments, or both. But what we have understood is these gene expression scores don't tell us what kind of chemotherapy to give. So we have a lot of things that we still are exploring and need to understand. Well, thanks. Can I Open. interrupt? That's a oh. perfect, what's that? Laura, can I interrupt just a second? This is Nola. Yes. Um, and uh, there's some questions that I think are probably good if, if um, Sandy- We're gonna learn, so, so Nola, let us, we're, I'm just gonna do the introduction of the panel and then I'm okay. gonna let you start with the questions. Okay. Let me just finish introducing everybody and then and then you can just tee up all the questions. Oh, and oh, I forgot, but it's good to say there's a question and answer box that everybody has at the bottom of their screen. So send those questions in. And as soon as we introduce the finish the introductions of the panelists, we're going to start answering all of your questions. Okay, that thanks. Sounds good. So, Laura, uh, Van Fier is next. And so perfectly following on what Hope is doing. 
uh, what Hope was saying, you know, you've spent your entire life developing biomarkers to better figure out who needs what, what kind of treatment and chemotherapy in particular, and now really helping us to stratify who should get what treatment. Tell, a, tell everybody what a biomarker is and um, what, makes it, what makes it useful. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> yes, my life, most of it, I've been spending my work life on uh, looking at biomarkers. So what those are, actually, Sandy Borowski, he pointed out a microscope behind, <clears throat> behind him in his room. So pathologists look at the tumor from the outside. So actually, the outside of the tumor can have biomarkers, too. But what I've been doing is looking at biomarkers on the inside of the tumor cells. So biomarkers are measures of what, how the tumor cells are behaving. So there are uh, 25,000 genes in every cell. That sounds overwhelming, it is. Um, it's amazing that the system of our cells and bodies work with so many different buttons that can be pushed uh, to get on and off. But in every cell, your skin cell, your gut cell, a set of those genes is active or not. And so you have, can have biomarkers for your normal cells, but there are also biomarkers that will identify which buttons got pushed in that cancer cell. So what a molecular biologist, which I am, does is to extract the information from the inside of the tumor cells and identify the sets of genes that are active or not active in the tumors. And if that is an interesting and, and telling group of genes, then we call that a biomarker. It can be one gene, can be a group of gene that foretells if the tumor is aggressive and has the capacity to invade in surrounding tissue. And it can tell <clears throat> if, the, if the activity is on that could be responsive for a certain therapy. So beyond, we were talking before at the estrogen receptor, which is a molecule that sits on the outside of the cancer cell, but we can look on the inside of the cancer cell if the so-called signaling pathway is really active in that tumor cell that has the estrogen receptor on the outside. So if we start to block the working of the estrogen receptor with hormonal therapy, then we want to make sure that the inside of the cancer cell was, and the cancer by itself is really, the growth is dependent on that activity. So what a molecular biologist, and we do that by reporting on biomarkers does, is to say in this particular tumor that is estrogen receptor positive, it is also estrogen receptor type, meaning that the estrogen activity is active. And so that gives further refinement what therapy will likely uh, be beneficial for the patient. And okay. I think we'll come back to these biomarkers later too. Exactly. Um, we'll, we'll have lots more time to talk about it. Okay. So I'm going to turn next to Denise Wolf. So Denise Wolf is a computational biologist, and she's going to explain to you what that is. She takes all the information that we take. And for example, she'll tell us maybe a little bit in our iSpy trial where we've been trying to sort out using lots of different treatments, who responds best to what therapies and how to figure out what the right strategy might be for us going forward to do a better job of assigning tumors, I mean, treatments to people with particular tumor types. So Denise, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you're trying to, in, and how why your work is so important in helping us put a put a new light on on how on how to do our assign our treatments. Denise, are you on? I don't. Denise. Oh, there we go. There you go. That's Perfect. Better. Okay. Before I was just. <laughs> talking to myself. I was actually, I was talking to my pet. I wasn't talking to myself. I, I correct myself. Okay. So a computational biologist is a person who applies tools from statistics, systems, biology, engineering, and computer science, along with an understanding of biology to solve problems important to medicine or biology, such as how to use uh, 
genetic information, gene expression, protein expression, spatial organization in tumors, and other data from tumors and from blood to find robust markers of response to a variety of different types of targeted or chemotherapies, where the goal is to treat each cancer patient with the medicines that are most likely to save his or her life. So in iSpy2, we have two biomarker programs. One focuses on testing published biomarkers reflecting the mechanisms of action of each iSpy2 experimental agent. And another tries to discover new biology associated with response to different types of agents. Through these programs, we develop something like a sorting hat that, that for each person takes data about the tumor and perhaps the blood and immune system to identify the biology associated with sensitivity or resistance to each class of agent, and then comes up with a ranked list of which agent a pa patient is most likely to respond to and the probabilities of response to each. Examples include patients with tumors that are immune high, who are most likely to respond to immunotherapy, or those with DNA, DNA repair uh, deficient tumors, such as those who are uh, BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers who respond really well to D DNA damaging agents combined with PARP inhibitors. So these biomarkers join others reflecting, say, her tunis, which was already discussed, and the dominance or lack thereof of estrogen related signaling in the context of tumor cell proliferation to give a more complete picture of a cancer's biology and likely vulnerabilities to each of the many classes of treatments that are now being assessed for e efficacy. So overall, the goal of our biomarker program led by Laura Vandeveer is to come to an understanding of who responds to different kinds of treatments and why with the objective of bringing every patient to a complete response and fantastic odds of living a long life. Well, thanks, Denise. That was the most efficient way to describe what you do that I've <laughs> ever heard. That is really great. But I think that gives people out there an idea just like the pathologist is looking at the outside of the cell and there's so much more going on inside. I think all of you out there are seeing what we do on the outside, but there's so much more work going on on the inside to try and figure out how to do it better uh, tomorrow than we are today. Um, so the last person in the panel before we start to get to your questions is Mike Campbell. And um, Mike is an immunologist and, uh, and I've been working with Mike for many, many years. He's just awesome. And Mike, can you explain to us really, you know, you know, everyone's very excited about immunotherapy and maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, how most of these, the drugs that are on the market work today, why they work, but maybe reflect a little bit about why is it taken so long to, to figure out how, how, <coughs> how to get the, find the right drugs and, and they're not perfect yet. So how are we going to make them better? Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, well, the, these drugs Laura's discussing are called um, checkpoint inhibitors. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, because I think I just blocked out here. Um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, essentially what they do is, unlike chemotherapy, which targets directly the tumor cells, these drugs target your immune system. Um, and it's taken us a while to learn how to use them because basically it's taken us a while to understand the immune system and how the immune system responds to cancer. And what's been found is that you have T cells, which is a type of white blood cell that can attack cancer cells. But in a normal response, these T cells will be come activated. And then once they've done what they need to do, like clear bacteria or a virus, you need a way to shut those T cells down. Otherwise, you get autoimmune disease. So there are these molecules called checkpoint molecules that are on the T cell that basically put breaks on the T cell. Well, it turns out that cancer cells can express a different kind of checkpoint that while the T cells are trying to um, kill the tumor cells, the tumor cells are putting the brakes on the T cells. So there's this checkpoint interaction that's happening. And these checkpoint inhibitors, drugs like many people have heard of like pembrolizumab or tezolizumab, they block that interaction. So they put, take the brakes off, basically turn the accelerator back on these T cells and these T cells can then activate, um, become more activated and kill the, the cancer cells. <clears throat> on your second question, <clears throat> excuse me. The second question is like, so, so then, and how, they're not perfect. I mean, we still got a ways to go. What, 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 what do you think it's gonna take to help us make it better? Yeah, they're not perfect for a number of reasons. One is some patients' cancers just don't have many T cells there. 
So if you don't have a T cell to target, your drug's not going to work. It's like if you don't have a HER2 positive tumor, HER2 is probably not going to work. HER2 is probably not going to work. Um, so one thing we have, need to have a better understanding of is the tumor immune microenvironment and who's there and what cells besides T cells. For example, there are other cells called macrophages, D cells, other cells that we can potentially target either to change the tumor, the immune microenvironment to be more anti-tumor or to help get more T cells in there to make these immune checkpoints work better. That's great. Okay, so Nola, I'm sure that the questions are, are piling up. So why don't you start by giving us the first question that you have for us, for the panel. Okay, yes, uh, questions are coming in. And uh, in the, the one when I um, interrupted earlier, so sorry, but those questions were um, more pertinent, and I think, to the discussion that Sandy and Hope were having. Um, and one is, how does fish analysis work? So simply, and a nuance on that is, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. It can be confusing. How? What does it all mean? And and I think even further to that. So Sandy, you can explain what fish is, and then uh, I think after twenty five years or thirty years. We still have questions. It's still not perfect, and hope you can talk about some of the dilemmas of what we do when it's on the border. So, Sandy, why don't you start by explaining what fish? What, what well, I have to start. Are, by... are, are, are we talking about the fish you can eat? No, <laughs> it stands for fluorescence and situ hybridization. We're not going to cook them at our cooking demonstration. No. Yeah, in order to explain um, HER2 testing, both uh, by protein or it's called IHC immunohistochemistry, or by fish, I have to teach you all to be molecular biologist. So look out, Laura V. They're all going to take your job after I get done with this very brief introduction to molecular biology. And what you need to know is that every cell in your body has a complete set of instructions, DNA, but every cell uses those instructions a little bit different and cancer cells get aberrations in those instructions. The instructions are conveyed to be acted on from the DNA through the RNA. And then the RNA in turn tells the cell how to make the proteins and the proteins are what actually do the work. So for HER2 receptor, we look at both the protein that is a, a receptor. So it sits on the surface of the cell and it's trying to look for signals outside the cell. And um, we, we do that with the technique called IHC. So many of you who've had biopsies with cancer will have an IHC report for the HER2. We can also look at the DNA. And HER2 is very unique in that the increased level of receptor on the surface can be predicted by looking at the number of copies in the DNA. And that doesn't hold up for every gene in the genome. Some genes are regulated through complicated pathways. But HER2, it turns out the more copies you have in the cancer cells, the more protein is expressed and the better that is as a target for the HER2 directed therapies. So in order to look at the copies in the tumor cells, we take that tumor biopsy and we make a special preparation called fluorescence in situ hybridization. Those are big words, but what it means is we put a little fluorescent glowing tag on a probe that will stick exactly to the part of the DNA that has that gene. And then we can count how many times that probe sticks in an individual cancer cell. And then we count a bu whole bunch of cancer cells. So we always count at least 40 cancer cells and we count how many copies are there. And there should be two. You should have a normal number is two copies, which is one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad in your set of instructions. But in a cancer cell, we see increased copies. We might see a few increased copies, or we might see a lot of increased copies. And a typical HER2 positive by fish might have 30 or 40 or 50 extra copies of the gene. And then so that's how we do it. And you're all wait, now but, but empowered you to be molecular normal, biologists. Right, but, yeah, but you also look at the normal part, right? Because you divide it, it's a ratio, right? Well, the ratio is, is, is worth talking about too. So the way that uh, cancer cells work, they can get whole chromosomes. You, you know that we all have 23 chromosomes. You can have whole co chromosome copy numbers increased. And that's important 
um, because it tells you that the cancer has sort of lost its way in terms of how many, um, how, how it deals with uh, chromosome separation when it divides. But, um, but the HER2 gene in particular, it gets spliced into new locations and new chromosomal locations. And so we want to see how many, it, the, its normal chromosome is 17. So we count how many chromosome 17s do you have in those cancer cells? And again, the normal number is two, but a lot of cancers have three or four. Um, and then we count how many HER2 copies there are. If it's the same number, we say that's not really HER2 amplification per se, that's the whole chromosome being duplicated. But if we see more copies of HER2 than we do of chromosome 17, we say, aha, that's amplification. So that's where the ratio comes in. So I know it's confusing, but... Well, but it's perfect when it's very high or when it's normal. It's, when it's, it's when it's in between that it becomes right, difficult. So what do you do when it's on the border? What is a medical oncologist to do with this information? Well, you know, it's an ongoing question, as you pointed out. We have these uh, a guideline group called the ASCO CAP guidelines, and this is the American Society of Clinical Oncology working with the College of American uh, Pathologists. And actually, it's a it says America there twice, but it's an international panel. And uh, it's a lot of smart people who've been working together on trying to understand how to interpret both the immunohistochemistry or IHC and FISH. As you just heard, it's a complicated process. So the IHC, you know, if you look at a brown, this is the oncology side talking to the pathologist, you're looking under a microscope at this little bit of the tumor and you have to decide how brown it looks. So the antibody has a brown color on it and they drop it on there. And then it either looks really brown, a little brown, not so much or not at all. And so they score it actually with uh, zero, one, two, three. And the problem is that we know that some of it is your technique and how good you are at doing it. So uh, we know generally, if you have the strongest positivity, you have positivity for HER2 and many centers do not then do a fish. However, if you're two plus, about 20% of those or so arguably could be positive. So we don't really know. And then zero and one, a really small number could be positive because you were just wrong with the test. So then you do this fish test. So we're in the oncology side going, okay, it's three plus, we're pretty sure it's positive. So we're comfortable. Now it's two plus or less, and we don't really know. So we get back our fish test. And then the fish tells you in general, there's a ratio. Some people only look at that copy number for her too. And the ratio tells you, so you have the HER2 copy number, right? Sitting on that one chromosome. And then you have the thing that holds the chromosome together, centromere 17, and they make this ratio. Well, there could be too many centromere 17s and we don't really know. So as the oncologist, we're then using the guidelines and talking to our pathologist and trying to say, is it, does it meet this criteria? So we have criteria where just the copy number being really high, six or more is a positive. If it's really low, it's generally not positive and we don't generally see high ratios. But sometimes what happens is a ratio of two or more is supposed to be positive, but it could be 2.02, you know, this is just math. And then we don't really know what to do. So what we've done actually are a lot of our colleagues have looked at patients who have strongly hormone receptor positive cancers. And those low ratios generally have correlated with not a great response to HER2 targeted therapy. So we might not expect as good a benefit, but we are in a little bit of a bind because if you're positive by any mechanism, by any way, and we're sure that wasn't, you know, uh, maybe uh, sometimes, and I'll just show you this, tell you this one thing is that you could have in situ or non-invasive cancer and invasive cancer. The in situ cancer could be positive and the invasive not, and we don't treat for that. So Thank one you. of the things I wanted, to, I wanted to point out just for this too, is this is, I think uh, uh, Laura Van Fier mentioned this before, how does the typing, how does the HER2 typing help us sort that out? What is, and how are we thinking about maybe using that, Laura? Well, so let me just finish that one sentence, if you don't mind terribly, that what we do, and it's short, is that if you have a positive test by any means, even if it's low, we tend to treat as if you have HER2 positive disease because it makes such a huge impact on outcome. It might not make as big an impact if you have a low ratio, but we still have found that it makes some impact. Laura V. Yes. 
Um, and this might be somebody asked in the chat a question, what happens if all of you disagree, what do you do? And so both Hope and I oh, were answering. And this, is, and this, is, this <laughs> happens all the time, or not all the time. Some, some situations are very clear with all the standards we have. It's very clear what needs to be done. Sometimes there are these questions like we're discussing this. What if the HER2 is like in between sort of, is it amplified or is it not? And so then comes in further, we can do further testing, which happens often. So what I explained to you before, what biomarkers can do, they look into the cell. So when the HER2, which we were just discussing, is a molecule, a protein that sits on the outside, so it's being counted how many there are, what I'm looking at subsequently is whether the signals that such a HER2 molecule in the, on the outside will send into the cell is actually functioning. So there can be, for, of those proteins of HER2 can be on the outside, because, but if the next signaling molecule that sits inside the cell is absent, then the cell doesn't know. I mean, there can be hundreds of those molecules on the outside, but if the ins, inside of the cell cannot signal that that signal from her to all the way to where it needs to land to say the cell will divide this cell will um, respond in such a way then that's of no use so what we have developed and and denise wolf is part of all of these types of things is that we look into the tumor cells and we see if the her to signaling is active and the biomarker we look at the gene activity, the RNAs, the proteins, and we make a judgment, which we then call this tumor is HER2 type. So where the HER2 molecule on the outside, we're, 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 we're naming that is HER2 amplified, present, absent. If we come in, Denise and I, then we look at the inside of the tumor cell and we say this tumor cell is really HER2 type meaning okay. that the HER2 program of activity is on. And we can do that for many different uh, pathways, as signaling pathways that all have something to do with different treatments. Okay, well, thank you because we've got lots of, apparently lots of questions to answer. So Nola, what's next? Yeah, so there are great questions coming in. I think another one, um, Laura V, since you're on this topic, what are some of the upcoming biomarkers that will be included in routine clinical care or should be included in routine clinical care? So what do we see most closely on the horizon? Yes. So the routine clinical care is something that's decided mostly by those committees that Hope was just um, referring to, like the ESCO CAP guideline committee, um, treatment guidelines from NCCN. And I think the ones that will that are starting to come in, are, there are actually this class of HER2 type, basal type, luminal type. So that will beyond the receptors, estrogen receptor, progesterone, HER2 on the outside, it will take into account if the inside of the cancer cell is really functioning as being estrogen receptor positive that we call luminal type. Uh, whether a tumor, of course, as some of you will know, can be triple negative. So all of these receptors, progesterone, estrogen, and HER2 are absent. So triple negative, we call basal type. But there's actually a part of the tumors that are estrogen receptor on the outside, which on the inside are basal type. And I think we'll start... So if the outside determination is estrogen receptor progesterone HER2, what will be added is that the inside activity, estrogen slash luminal type, uh, HER2 type, um, basal type will be added to that. And then you'll see subtle shifts because some of the estrogen receptor positives are actually basal. Some of the HER2, most of the HER2 Type, but actually some of the HER2 positives are um, estrogen functioning being luminal type. So this will all start to get an influence on 
what treatment yeah. or combination of treatments will be recommended. So that sounds confusing, I'm sure, to the people out there. But really, it's if you think about it, one of, and this is something actually in our iSpy trial, we've been measuring all of these biomarkers in the background, and we've been testing it. We've now put 24 different types of agents in. I mean, there are 24 agents, but in different categories. And Denise, why are you saying that some of these new combinations um, should be used? What, what makes, what in your mind makes it that we should be thinking about changing the way we classify tumors? I'll give you an example. Um, so for triple negative breast cancer, there are kind of like two, there are sort of three approaches people are taking to it. One is just sort of old time standard of care. And that's like, you know, you know, anthracyclines, uh, taxanes. Um, then we have immunotherapy coming on the scene and some trials have looked at it with carboplatin, some have looked at it without, and then there are, there's using carboplatin and possibly a PARP inhibitor. And so for a triple negative patient, um, you need to know what you want, your, your objective and you know, Laura Esterman's trial, part of what she wants to, uh, what, what we, we as a group wanna find out is how to give each person what they need, but only what they need. So we don't wanna give them excess toxicity if they don't need it. So if you're a triple negative patient and you have, um, and you have like an immune, a high, you know, enriched immune milieu, that means you're, probably, you're, you're likely to respond to immunotherapy and you may not need to have like a carboplatin, a platinum drug added to that. Whereas there are patients who have um, really DNA repair deficient uh, cancers, like you know, if they have, if you have a germline BRCA1, then um, you probably don't need immunotherapy, which also has its risks. And so, so we need to add these new biomarkers so that every patient can respond, have a good outcome, a good prognosis and have a minimal amount of toxicity. Right, so that's the essence of personalized medicine. And that's what clinical trials are for. And that there are, the iSpy2 trial is moving what I call iSpy2.2, hopefully by the spring, we'll be able to start doing more of that, more for, the, more for the people that need it and less for the people that don't. And you know, when you come up with something new, you can't just put it into practice. You say, look, we've established this over 10 years of work, but now we're gonna test it. Um, and we're going to give everybody their best shot, uh, multiple shots at goal. So we're going to hopefully really add a lot to, to learn how to personalize therapy. And just before we go to the next question, Mike, I wanted to ask you about um, the special immune marker, the, this so-called PD-1 positive. This is something that people talk about a lot. And I think some of the work you've done has shown uh, probably not quite that simple. And what might be some of the ways in which we think about how to measure whether a tumor is kind of ready. When you look at it, you and Sandy look at it under the microscope and can parse it out. What are some of the things you think might be better predictors? Sure, um, so PD-1, PD-L1 are two of these checkpoint molecules that I alluded to before. Um, and there are drugs that target either PD-1 or PD-L1 to again, take the brakes off of the T cells and get better T cell activity towards the tumor cells. Um, now PDL one has been used in a lot of cancers as a biomarker for who may or may not respond to a, a checkpoint inhibitor therapy, but it doesn't work across the board. And there um, are a number of, of issues with how it's, how it's measured. And as Sandy's alluded to, you know, it's one of these cases where it's on the surface of the cell, you do a staining and you look for color, you look for how much is there. What we're actually finding in the um, in our iSpy study is that it's not so much having PDL1 there on the tumor or PD1 there on the T cells, but it's actually having PDL PDL1 positive tumor cells or PDL1 positive other cells in close proximity to a PD1 positive T cell. So if you got these cells in close proximity, that's the interaction that these immune checkpoints are trying to in, inhibitors are trying to block. Um, so that's tends to be more predictive of who might respond to these um, checkpoint inhibitors, as opposed to having, you know, PD-1 cells over here and PD-L1 cells over here where there's no interaction. So there's no interaction to block with these drugs. Right, and so, so part of our, some of the strategies that are coming up that we can test are 
things that we can do to either put into the tumor or bring T cells into the tumor so that they're close together. That's, those are some of the strategies that we're hoping will make these responses even better or make the ones that aren't responsive more responsive. All right, Nola, what's the next question? Okay, um, so this one is, I think uh, many on the panel might have uh, um, things to offer. So if early detection is critical for cure and metastatic disease is the fatal problem, why is there almost no effort to detect impending metastasis after early treatment, i.e. until there is clinical evidence of metastasis? So I think that's a little thought-provoking uh, question. What and a great question. So I'm gonna try and do it in this order. And if everyone keeps their answers a little, little short, we can actually get through some more questions. So I'm gonna start, um, you know, why don't, so Hope, I'm gonna ask you why today we don't uh, do constant scanning. And then Laura V, I'm gonna ask you uh, about some of the emerging things like CT DNA, and then maybe Sandy, I'll come back to you for a reflection of how to sort these things out. Yeah, so Hope, why don't you start with why we don't uh, you know, follow everybody with all these tests like we used to. Yeah, and it, it actually, it's such an important question because it makes a lot of sense if you're sitting with early stage cancer that you would want to look for an early recurrence so that you could do something about it that would change outcome. Unfortunately, what we found is that once a cancer metastasizes, and that means to another place in your body, so not the breast or the draining lymph nodes, but to another place, that finding it three months earlier doesn't help you any actually. And so getting uh, radiation for scans um, and even blood tests on a regular basis hasn't changed survival. And that's what you want. You want something that helps you doesn't hurt you and improves survival. Instead, you're getting scans all the time and worrying and maybe having unnecessary procedures. And I've even had seen patients whose scans were misinterpreted as showing metastatic disease and they were treated inappropriately or a focus was missed. So it turns out that the best way to follow patients now, and we'll talk about, I think the exciting new advances is to do a careful physical exam and have a very low threshold for testing if there are any symptoms. The other thing that's I think important is that if we were to have an idea that you might develop a recurrence, we would need to know that a change in treatment would change that risk. And that's what I'm gonna uh, send on to my the next respondent. Okay, Laura V. Yeah, I'm mute. I'm mute, Laura. I'm, I'm unmuted. And if uh, anyone, and if you guys were present last week, Laura, uh, or you, or if you missed it, go and hear Laura's talk uh, where she really explains what circulating DNA is all about. It's a much longer, she had like 15 minutes or 10 minute explanation. She's going to give us a one or two minute explanation today. So I'm, I'm totally with the person who answered the question because we would want to know as early as possible, are there any signs in a healthy person that, it, that there might be a tumor? And similarly, uh, if somebody has had all the treatments for a first breast cancer, can we find early signs of a recurrence to actually act on it uh, as soon as, as possible? And so even though Dr. Rugo is correct that we don't know exactly yet how we then should act, but the technology, biomarkers again, to look into the blood for if there are is so-called circulating tumor DNA is starting to help us to answer that question. So what we have learned is that tumors actually, while they are growing, even if they're very, very small, start to shed their DNA into the bloodstream. So while a tumor grows, there are also cells that actually die in the tumor cell. Um, they cannot keep up with what's going on. And so that those tumor cells that are so-called dying, they shed DNA into the bloodstream. And we have now very sensitive technology that can identify so-called circulating tumor DNA, which is characterized by a specific uh, difference between a tumor cell and a normal cell. 
So we need to understand better how to act to decide if, a, if immediate imaging might be then needed or if there is a treatment we can give. So that I, I ended my talk last, last week that as a disclaimer that this is all research still, but we're actively pursuing that because we feel that this may help um, to prevent any occurrence or reoccurrence of cancer if we can act early on. Yeah, so, and just to, just to say, the first thing that we can do, we don't know that we should treat more because of these kinds of new biomarkers. But the one thing that we can all do together, and that is really this big experiment that hundreds and hundreds of us are embarked upon with iSpy2, is an experiment of how best to prevent metastatic disease. You know, one of the people who have more aggressive and larger tumors, you know, are the people who have the most risk. And what we're trying to do is say, how can we get everyone to a place where we've done the most we can to reduce that chance up front? So it's not about screening people, it's about trying to get people to their best response and reduce that risk. And again, this is a, a change in the way we're trying to think about how to treat. So we're gonna do it in the setting of a clinical trial where we give people the first treatment, as Denise was saying, if they have a great response, they can go to the operating room. If they don't, they get the next best thing that we think for their biomarker profile. And then if that doesn't work, we go on to maybe that's when we would give the adromycin or the anthracyclines, or maybe we'll have something better. But it's this experiment that we're embarking upon to say, how do we reduce the evidence of tumor to its lowest amount? And, and tests like this circulating DNA can be, you know, we're looking to incorporate that if the data so, show that it's helpful into this trial. And as I said, in the spring, that will be the new approach. That's what we're all working towards. So Sandy, I'd like you to comment back to one of your favorite topics that, you, you know, here you've got aggressive cancers, right? And you're looking for things. So, you know, that over-treating people with a different kind of cancer that's not risky is not solving the problem for these, for the high risk. So the, you know, the task at hand is trying to develop markers that really tell you more about the tumor up front, right? So you know who's risky and who's not. You want to make a comment about that? Yeah. So I'll start with this, the simple answer about what we do do for every patient to try and assess the risk of metastasis, and that's to look at that regional lymph node. And lymph node positivity um, is very important to us, but not exactly for the reason that you might think. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are metastases that we can't see yet or that we need to look for by scan. But what it does mean is that that tumor is capable of growth in a new non-physiologic ectopic site. So that's the biomarker that we're looking at. Meaning look not, at the breast. Not, the not the breast. Not the breast, in the lymph node. So, so we now know, um, and timing is everything. We, we now know that kind of all tumors are, are releasing their cells and their DNA, and we can find those sometimes in the bloodstream, maybe in very low levels, but we can find those. But just by virtue of being in the bloodstream does not mean that they're capable of growing in the ectopic site. So it's that, that extra behavior that we measure, uh, right now we measure by looking at the lymph nodes. But I think we're learning to measure it also with the gene expression signatures, the what is on in the cell and are the things that are on in the cell conferring that ability or not conferring that ability to grow in the ectopic site. So those are the things that I, I'm really excited about in predicting, not only predicting who, who has a higher risk of having those uh, metastases appear later, but also predicting um, who doesn't, who has a tumor that uh, has no capacity for that, who really doesn't need to worry about distant metastases because there's no evidence that that cancer has that capacity. And so those are the things I'm really excited about right. looking at. And that's a whole nother part of the program, which we didn't get to, but really trying to figure out who has indolent disease and who can really have a lot less treatment. 
And that's going to go for DCIS as well. So we're really working hard to personalize therapy. So that's what this whole effort among all of us is all about. Okay, last question. Such a great panel. It's hard. I'm sure there's like tons more and, and we'll, we'll try and answer your, we'll, we'll put up a, an answer to your questions later uh, when we get all the questions. But Nola, you'll have the hard task of picking one last question for us. Yeah, there really are great questions and hopefully all will be answered. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, it, if someone is, has a high risk of breast cancer, whatever that means, does that necessarily mean that that's a high risk for an aggressive cancer or a bad uh, outcome? What a perfect question, actually. And if you stay for the intern talks, you're going to hear a lot more about that because you can be at risk for uh, a cancer that's not very aggressive. You can be at risk for a very aggressive cancer. And that is part of what, are the, what, are, what we're trying to work on for the wisdom study, which is to try and learn who's at risk for what kind of cancer. So stay tuned for those, um, uh, for, for those intern presentations that are coming up. So who wants to, who wants to take on that, that question? I just say, maybe I'll, I'll say one thing I know about this, which I, I think is, is very interesting. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, it, it's like, it's a fantastic question. Like even in, if you think about like a BRCA1 mutation, um, BRCA1, you know, patient, people who carry BRCA1 mutations have this really high risk of developing breast cancer um, over their lifetime. But it seems like different families, even families who have very high penetrance of, of cancer, like lots of women up and down, and even men kind of up and down the family tree who get it, some are more deadly than others. And, and an example is in my, um, my husband's family, they carry a BRCA1 mutation. And there are tons of people who have had breast cancers and ovarian cancers. It's everywhere. And it seems like in this particular family, everyone got cancer and nobody died. You know, it's like it didn't actually, and this is before treatments were a lot better. And you have other families where the lethal cancer. So it's, it's like, it's, it's like a big, it's a big topic. And I. Yeah, so I, I, I know our panel's drawing to a close, but I think that brings up a really important question. I think there are three things to think about. One is you can have a very aggressive cancer and it doesn't mean that you're gonna die of it. The whole point of the iSpy program is to say, how do we get the right treatment at the right time to the right person? And we can measure, that's one of the reasons why we don't start with surgery first is because we know, and I can say this as a surgeon, if you've got an aggressive cancer that has the potential to spread, surgery is not going to cure you. Surgery is a part of your therapy, but it's just not curative in that sense. It, it, but what if you sequence the surgery after the systemic treatment, after Hope gives her treatments and recommendations or any of the oncologists, we can measure what's left. And even if we think it's gone, if there is something left, then we can do more or we can learn more about what that is. So the goal is to prevent metastatic cancer by really doing a better job. And if you really have a great response, your outcome is so much better like someone with a stage one cancer. And that's part of the whole situation is we're trying to figure out, are you at risk for an early recurrence? Are you at risk for a late recurrence? What are the right therapies? Because you can have risk, but certain, you know, hormone therapy is not going to help you if you don't have the estrogen receptor or the estrogen type. And chemotherapy is not going to help you if your tumor doesn't grow very quickly, but that doesn't mean you don't have risk. So those are some of the things that we have to sort out, right? And you know, and this whole effort of the wisdom study, which you're going to learn about in the intern talks, is that we are actually trying to find a better way to screen for cancer and look not just at the risk factors that people have when they started having children and when they started their periods, but also how dense is their breast tissue? What genes did they uh, inherit? Not just the mutations that Denise was talking about, but the combinations of genes in the background that might actually be protective. So you could have these bad genes, these bad mutations, but you've got the rest of the DNA in place as a protection. So these are all the things that we have to learn. But at the Breast Care Center, we're just not settling for status quo. Our job is to advance the state of the art so that tomorrow your kids 
and your family won't have to face the fear of a lethal uh, breast cancer. So um, I'm going to, it's now unfortunately 10 o'clock. Um, this has been a fantastic panel and I just wanna thank everybody for being part of it. Sandy Borowski from UC Davis, thank you for spending your morning with us. Good luck on your grant. Hope Rugo, thank you so much from coming all the way from the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and our, our fabulous oncologist, uh, at the at the Breast Care Center, Laura Van Veer, molecular biologist par excellence. And now everybody knows what a computational biologist is, thanks to Denise Wolf and Mike Campbell. Thank you for explaining so clearly um, how the immune system works in two minutes or less. Pretty awesome. And Nola Hilton, thank you for moderating. And if you want to understand how we're using imaging to try and figure out who is responding or not to these therapies, stay tuned for her talk, which is right after our cooking demonstration in our taste for science section. So thanks to the panel, big round of virtual applause. Okay, um, all right, so we have a treat for you. So our, as, as we said before, um, you know, the whole, I, the, the panel really talks about the concept and the notion of personalized medicine, right? So let's go ahead and put up the slides for the next section. And we'll start with our lightning talks. Each of these talks are about three minutes a piece and they're all given by our fabulous post-baccalaureate interns. These, uh, in, we have a program where people spend a year or two before they go off to graduate school, often medical school or others. And all of you heard, you heard from six, from seven of them last week, and you're gonna hear uh, seven more this week. And uh, they spend a year or two, and part of what they do is they are uh, helping us explain, uh, as they're learning about all these programs, to explain some of these complicated concepts in three minutes or less to all of you. So the theme uh, today, next slide, go ahead. And the theme for today is what is a personalized approach for breast cancer, right? So we, as we, the whole panel was really talking about how to do more for the people with higher risk and to de-escalate when treatments are effective so we can make them less toxic. That was uh, what Denise was saying, right? And to escalate when treatments are not effective and save lives. So one of the ways to prevent metastatic disease is to keep going until we get to the end point that we think will give people a great outcome. So we have to have the tools and the framework to know the difference. And that's the work that we're embarked upon uh, at the Breast Care Center. So without further ado, I'm going to start with Tommy, who's, and these, uh, this, these talks are gonna actually help uh, answer the questions that were asked at the end of the last panel. So Tommy's gonna, Tommy Lewis is gonna talk to us about our, the rest of the information in your DNA and how it informs breast cancer risk. Tommy. Thank you, Dr. Esserin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tomi, and today I'm going to be talking about how our whole genome informs breast cancer risk. Next, please. Our genome holds the information to protect us from developing breast cancer. Our genome is our DNA. We can think of DNA like a string of three billion beads. Here on the right is what a tiny segment of what our DNA might look like, AAT, CGT. Small variations in these beads define, for instance, whether we have brown eyes or blue eyes, curly hair or straight hair. Grouped together, these beads make up our genes, and our genes hold the information to prevent our breast tissue from developing breast cancer. Variations in our string of beads can exist in our inherited genes, which we call genetic mutations, or in breast cancer risk single nucleotide polymorphisms. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, are the most common type of genetic variation among us. A SNP would be if our string of beads, AAT, CG, CGT, became AAT, GGT. These genetic variations help determine an individual's risk for developing breast cancer. Next. Currently, there are nine genes that we know of that are associated with breast cancer. They are listed here at the bottom of the slide in purple. The normal function of these genes are to keep our breast tissue in check to prevent breast cancer. However, if they are mutated, they do not have the locks and breaks needed to monitor cell growth. And this is what can lead to breast cancer. Single gene mutations help to explain about 23% of breast cancers. 
The blue slice of the pie chart shows that combinations of multiple low risk breast cancer SNP variations help to explain about 36% of heritable risk. Race and ethnicity are also very important in our understanding of genetic risk and SNPs. You'll hear more about this in the next presentation on the importance of diversity in clinical research. Having fully functioning genes or no SNP variations does not guarantee that an individual will not develop breast cancer. This is the unexplained 41% of the pie chart. We have either not discovered these genes yet, they might not be caused by genetic factors, or it could be a complex combination of both of these variables. Next. This research tells us that when we look at our genome, we can better stratify individuals into low risk and high risk categories for developing breast cancer. The WISDOM study, which is led by Dr. Laura Esserman, is a nationwide clinical study focused on making breast cancer screening more personalized. The WISDOM study compares annual mammograms to personalized screening, which considers genetic risk factors. I warmly welcome you to join WISDOM or to share the study with your family and friends, as the more women who participate, the more we can learn and the more informed our screening practices can become. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tomi. And um, that was a great explanation. And just reminding everybody, uh, stay tuned for the upcoming cooking demonstration. I'm hoping you're planning to cook along with us. Okay. so. Uh, Yes, yeah, so the wisdom study is something that everyone can join if they haven't had cancer. So many of you on the, on the, who are listening in today have had cancer yourself, but I'm sure you know lots of women who haven't. So please help us spread the word. Okay, Rashna Sunavala is our next intern and she's going to talk to us about why it matters uh, that we have a, a broad range of people who participate in the wisdom study, Rashna. Yes, thank you, Dr. Esterman, and good morning, everyone. My name is Rashna, and today I'll be talking about the WISDOM study, the importance of racial and ethnic diversity, and its fundamental role in allowing us to improve breast cancer screenings for all women. Next slide. We know that mammograms are incredibly important for early breast cancer detection, yet within the medical community, there still isn't a clear consensus as to when or how often a woman should be getting screened. And now more than ever in the age of COVID-19, is it imperative that women understand when they need to come into the clinic? So the wisdom study asks, is it all right for us to continue along with annual screenings or is it better to be screened on a more personalized schedule based on your medical history, your family history and your behaviors unique to you and your body? Because we know just like with breast cancer treatment or even a bra, one size does not fit all. But in order for us to truly answer this question, we need our wisdom study population to look like that of the US. We know that breast cancer disproportionately impacts racial minorities. Black women are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer and Hispanic women are 30% less likely to be diagnosed. Yet the majority of our wisdom study population comes from white women. And as we heard in last week's case for the CURE panel and in the last presentation, this impacts how we as researchers assess risk. Next slide. And so the wisdom study is addressing this. Thanks to an NCI grant, we've expanded study sites in diverse areas across the country. We've partnered with physicians who serve minority populations to spread trusted information about wisdom. We've enlisted in a community advisory board where we as researchers take a step back and we listen to what community leaders tell us their members value. Our study is available in Spanish and English and uses easy to read inclusive language. We are improving our genetic testing methods to better assist, assess risk in minority populations. And we are redesigning our website to one, be mobile friendly in case you don't have access to a computer and two, to also improve the way in which we share risk-related information. And while all these efforts are steps in the right direction, together we can do even more. Next slide. And so I'll end with a quote from a wisdom study participant. She says, I'm tired of hearing reports that African-Americans are disproportionately impacted by coronavirus, diabetes, stroke, asthma, various cancers. There must be some reason why that's the case, and I want to know what's going on. I have decided to enter a clinical trial to help find out why us. I invite you to join the wisdomstudy.org research 
if you never had breast cancer, it could save your life. And so I'll echo her words by saying, if you are a woman between the age of 40 to 74 with no history of breast cancer or DCIS, join wisdom, not for the benefit of the researcher, but for you, for your family and for your community. It's safe, it's easy and it's impactful. Next slide. And to learn more about how to join Wisdom, you can visit the links on this slide, which will be available to you after today's event. Thank you. I was gonna say, and it is available in Spanish uh, uh, as well. So thank you so much, Rashna, beautifully said. Okay, and just reminding people, um, that we've got lots, lots more to come. We're gonna learn about MRI later in the program and uh, getting ready for that cooking demonstration. Okay, now we're gonna to turn to another topic, which is what do we do when people are diagnosed with a precancerous lesion, so-called ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS? This is a very confusing topic. And Christian Maldonado Rodas is going to explain to us what it is and some of the things we're doing to try and sort out how best to treat it. Christian? Thank you for the, for the introduction, Dr. Esserman. Hi everyone, my name is Christian and today I will be presenting on active surveillance for low risk ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. Next. There are two categories of DCIS. There's DCIS that is at high risk of becoming invasive ductal carcinoma or IDC. And treatment options such as immunotherapy would be viable. You'll hear more about this in a subsequent presentation. Today, I will be talking about DCIS that is at low risk of becoming IDC, and therefore active surveillance would be a possible treatment option. Next. Before I talk about active surveillance, what is ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS? Formally, DCIS is the presence of carcinoma cells that line the inside of the duct, but have not invaded into surrounding tissue. On the left, you can see a lobule and a duct. Cancer can arise in both. You will hear more about invasive lobular cancer in a later presentation. Below, in the red box, you can see a slice of a duct filled with abnormal cells. You can think of this as a visual representation of DCIS. DCIS is currently treated with surgical excision, endocrine therapy, and radiation. However, it's super important to note that not all DCIS progresses into IDC. Therefore, surgical excision may constitute as overtreatment in some women. Next. At UCSF, we have been conducting active surveillance for DCIS to understand which women are at risk for invasive cancer. Active surveillance is a treatment plan chosen by women that monitors the progression of DCIS over time with imaging, such as MRI or mammography. Here, you can see what a typical protocol for active surveillance looks like. First, DCIS is diagnosed and the patient chooses active surveillance. Upon doing so, we obtain our first MRI. A radiologist decides whether the lesion is distinct. If not, then we obtain a second MRI at three or six months follow-up. Here, the same radiologist compares MRI1 with MRI2 and decides if the background parenchymal enhancement has increased or decreased. You can think of background parenchymal enhancement as the change in light within the MRI scan. If it has increased, then the provider recommends surgery. If it has decreased, then the patient continues with active surveillance. It's important to note that the patient can choose to undergo surgery at any point during active surveillance. Next. Our main goal is to personalize screening, treatment plans, and decreased overtreatment of low risk DCIS. We plan on creating an active surveillance protocol that will be distributed to our network hospitals and used as a method of determining which women are at low risk and would benefit from active surveillance and which women are at high risk and would benefit from other treatment options. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is a great uh, short uh, introduction that Nikki now is going to, uh, Nikki uh, Schindler is gonna talk to us about what happens if you have one of the higher risk DCIS? Can we do active surveillance or is there something better that might work? So without further ado, Nikki. Thank you, Dr. Esterman and good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about how we are harnessing the immune system and treating women who have high risk DCIS. Next slide, please. So what makes DCIS high risk? 
When a woman receives her DCIS diagnosis or ductal carcinoma in situ, in the majority of cases, like Christian spoke about, they're considered to be low risk of developing into an invasive ductal carcinoma. And so you heard a bit about active surveillance. So I wanna to talk to you about these minority cases that are considered carcinoma because of a few criteria, having HER2 positivity or hormone receptor negativity, being high grade, having a young age, so less than 45 years, a large size or being a palpable mass. So in the past, these cases have been treated with surgery and we're trying to understand how we can use immunotherapy in combination with surgery to get better outcomes in these cases. Next slide. And so Dr. Campbell spoke earlier about checkpoint inhibitors, but I wanna speak a little bit about how we can use the specific checkpoint inhibitors to treat these cases of high-risk DCIS. So here is an example of how this particular immunotherapy called Keytruda works. On the left, you can see in a case where someone has a tumor, the tumor is able to attach itself to the immune cell and essentially disable it. But when you introduce the immunotherapy into the environment, it's able to block the tumor's attempt to disable the cell and the immune system is able to counterattack against the cancer. And so Keytruda has been used to treat invasive breast cancer pretty effectively. However, it's administered at a very high dose, about 200 milligrams, which can cause toxicities. So what we've done is we've replaced this very high dose with a low dose local injection into the tumor, which has helped reduce toxicity in patients. Next slide, please. And so what does the future of treating DCIS look like? So, so far we've seen a very strong increase in immune cells in some of the patients who have received this Keytruda treatment. As you can see, from the pre-treatment and post-treatment images. In the post-treatment image, you can see all of these purple and green dots, and those represent immune cells. So although we've seen a very strong increase in the number, we haven't seen the immune cells necessarily working on the tumor cells. And so in the future, we hope to combine Keytruda with a new drug to create what we're calling the DCIS vaccine. And so we'll use this to not only treat DCIS, but also prevent recurrences of both DCIS and invasive cancer. So if you think you might be eligible or interested in becoming part of the study, please contact me. There's my phone number and my email, um, or you can visit the website about this particular clinical trial. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Nikki. And we are really working hard to try and find better ways to protect people or even find ways to reverse the growth of these tumors. Um, again, if we don't do something different, we're just gonna get the, do the same thing over and over again and we'll never learn or improve. Um, that's the whole purpose of clinical trials, to make tomorrow's treatments better than they are today. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna talk about a type of breast cancer that isn't as common as ductal cancer. And our own Ananya Mittal uh, is going to explain to us what's the difference between a lobular and ductal cancer and why we should be studying it specifically. Go ahead. Hey everyone, um, uh, can we go to the next slide? So Christian and Nikki were talking about DCIS or, or a type of precancerous lesion in the ducts of the breast. The other part that makes up the breast is the lobule. And this is where the milk is actually made. In this circle, you can see what's called the terminal ducts lobular unit. And this is where lobular carcinoma originates. Like Dr. Esselman said, this type of cancer is less common than ductal cancer and so hasn't been studied as thoroughly and, so, and we're trying to see what, what, the diff, what the characteristics of lobular carcinoma are that can inform the way that it's detected and treated. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. So if you look at the pathology images on the left, you can see that ductal cancer and lobular ca cancer look very different from each other. The ductal carcinoma or the ductal cancer grows in clumps and forms ball-like shapes, whereas the lobular cancer grows in single file lines and like a string. And so this more diffuse nature of lobular carcinoma makes it much harder to detect in imaging, which you can see in the MRIs on the right. It's kind of all over the place as opposed to a solid lump in the ductal cancer. Can we go to the next slide, please? Furthermore, 
Lobular cancers are often extremely hormone receptor positive or estrogen receptor positive. And this study here compares two different types of hormone therapy in patients with ductal carcinoma and lobular carcinoma. So just to explain this graph a little bit, the vertical line shows the percent of disease-free survival and the horizontal line shows the time from treatment. And what we can see here is that most patients on both types of hormone therapies are clustered around the same sorts of disease-free survival over time. However, patients with lobular carcinoma who are receiving a hormone therapy called tamoxifen have significantly worse outcomes over time. And this is extremely problematic because for a long time, tamoxifen was the standard of care hormone therapy given to patients. Um, and so what we can see looking at the information on these two slides, lobular carcinoma is harder to detect because of its diffuse nature and also may respond differently to standard breast cancer treatment. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing at UCSF to better detect, understand, and treat lobular cancer? To detect lobular cancer, we need better imaging tools. And what you can see in this image on the left is that a special type of PET scan called MAMI PET targets estrogen receptors, which we know lobular cancer has a lot of. And this leads to a much clearer picture of the lobular cancer lesion. In order to better understand outcomes of patients with lobular cancer, we have a database or a registry where we track surgical outcomes for these patients to see how we can improve what we do and how we treat them. And then to better improve treatment for these patients, we have a trial that looks at what the best hormone therapy is for these patients. And we compare, we randomly assign patients to three different types of hormone therapy in order to see what is most effective. And we also have an arm of the iSpy trial opening up that is specifically to figure out what the best hormone therapy is for patients with hormone cancer positive, low risk cancer. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, we know that ILC is a unique type of cancer that's different from ductal cancer and research is needed to better figure out ways to image and treat it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ananya. And following right along in that theme, we're gonna have, uh, Ulyssa uh, 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 Molina Vega, tell us a little bit more about how we might go, uh, you know, get to optimizing the treatment for hormone receptor positive tumors. I will also add that um, Rita Mukter, one of the surgeons in our group, has a particular interest in lobular cancer, and so she is guiding a lot of the work on lobular cancers. And Dr. Joe Chen, along with Rita and others, are working on trying to figure out how we can take people who have bigger cancers, but are hormone receptor uh, positive, and how to do what we've done in iSpy2 for women with these perhaps slower growing, but still significant risk cancers. So, Ulyssa, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today, I will talk about optimizing treatments for hormone receptor positive tumors. Next slide, please. Hormone receptor positive tumors express estrogen and progesterone receptors which make them sensitive to hormone treatment, and they are the most common type of cancer. Currently, the standard treatment is five years of endocrine therapy to block or inhibit the production of estrogen. This includes tamoxifen, ovarian suppression, and aromatase inhibitors. Hormone therapy is known to reduce the risk of recurrence, but the problem is late recurrence, which happens long after five years, and more than 50% of recurrences are late recurrences. Many years ago, before there were any treatments available, a pathologist in England collected breast cancer cases to classify the risk of recurrence based on the types of tumor. She showed that triple negative in red and HER2 positive tumors in green had early risk occurring primarily within the first five years, but hormone receptor positive tumors in blue had late risk after the five years. Next slide. However, the challenge is identifying who is at a higher risk of recurrence despite the five years of hormone therapy. There are two main reasons why patients are at risk of recurrence. The first is their underlying tumor biology, and second, their resistance to hormone therapy. To identify which tumors have the underlying tumor biology, multigene biomarkers are being used, which include these five on the left side. These are tests that can predict who needs chemotherapy and who doesn't, and they also predict the risk of recurrence over the next five to 10 years. Those who will not respond to chemotherapy are instead given hormone therapy, and we are using exploratory biomarkers to look at the response to it. 
For example, there are pathological markers such as KI67, which tells us how fast cells are growing. Imaging methods, including MRI, measures of volume before and after treatment, and FES PET, as you just saw a picture of that scan in Anania's presentation, uses estradiol to see if tumors are estrogen receptor positive. Lastly, blood methods include circulating tumor DNA, where a blood sample can be taken to detect the presence of cancer in the bloodstream. But a challenge is how do we know upfront if patients will respond to hormone therapy? That is what we will tackle with the endocrine optimization pathway coming soon to iSpy to figure out who is responding to hormone therapy from the beginning and therefore not wait five to 10 years to figure out who will have a recurrence. Next slide, please. If we can identify who is at a higher risk of late recurrence, then the question is, what can be done to reduce that risk? First is to choose the best type of therapy from the start by looking for new medicines that may be better tolerated than aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen, which is the goal of the endocrine optimization pathway. Also extending hormone therapy for 10 years rather than five years, adding novel therapies to endocrine therapy, developing the markers to tell us if people have responded well to the therapy, and finally, the best way forward is through clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulyssa, great job. And finally, we're going to finish with a talk from Anna Northrup about something called OneSource. And she's gonna explain what that is in just a minute, but I wanna remind everybody, we have two great things still coming up. Ali Mountford and I are going to show you how to make something delicious with whatever's in the fridge. I call it the whiff recipe. Uh, Ali Mountford from Enzen Stems will be doing that in about three minutes. So get in your kitchens and get ready to follow along with us. And then after that, Nola Hilton's gonna show us, tell us, uh, it unlock the mysteries of MRI and tell us, uh, tell us a little bit more how we're using that, especially in the iSpy trial to personalize care. So Anna, can you please tell us what is the, what, what's coming up in the way that we collect and use information and what is one source and why does it matter? Absolutely. So good morning, everyone. My name is Anna, and today I will be presenting on the one source solution, integrating clinical care and research to improve and expand our capacity to find cures for serious diseases such as breast cancer and COVID-19. Next slide, please. So health industries today are characterized by high operating costs with very little corresponding improvement in quality of care or meaningful scientific discoveries. One reason for these high costs, especially for clinical trials, stems from the electronic health record system. And the image on the right-hand side of the screen shows the flow of health data when information was collected on paper. Now focus on this image as we click once to see what happened after the implementation of the electronic health record system. You can see that the graphic looks nearly identical, meaning that almost no structural change occurred. And this is the state we currently operate in. Data flows in silos from the clinicians, represented by blue circles, to relevant stakeholders, such as researchers, represented in orange. And in this current system, health information that is collected by a clinician needs to be manually extracted from a clinical research database and re, excuse me, a clinical database and re-entered into a research database. And notice also that the arrows are unidirectional, meaning that any information collected by researchers is not necessarily available to clinicians. And when we did an analysis on the data extraction process of the iSpy2 trial, we found in some cases up to 40% error in translating data. And this is really significant because it requires time, energy, and focus to correct these errors, which directly detracts from the time that could be spent focusing on the science and patient care that drive innovation and allow us to discover novel therapeutic agents faster. So the bottom line is that currently doctors, researchers, and patients are trapped in an inefficient system that not only generates high costs, but also increases compliance risk and creates barriers to clinical trial participation. So what are we doing to remedy this? Next slide. We are building OneSource, a platform that will allow personalized medicine to flourish by integrating, clinical, or integrating care delivery, quality improvement, and clinical research. So like Dr. Esserman mentioned, the essence of personalized medicine is to do more for those with higher risk and less for those with lower risk, to de-escalate when treatments are effective and to escalate when they are not, and to have the tools and framework to know the difference. OneSource will help us do this. With the support of the FDA, we aim to accomplish this in two ways. First, by enabling the collection of high quality data at the point of care once to use many times through the use of standardized checklists 
and two, by creating a repository of trusted data that is accessible to all with permission. The image on your screen shows the one source model, and you'll notice in this model that in addition to clinicians gathering data, we'll also be able to easily track patient reported data, such as a quality of life survey, which can be completed at home or from a mobile device. And following the arrows on your screen from left to right, you'll notice that there's an arrow also pointing from researchers back to the center to represent the fact that in the one source model, important health information collected by researchers will be easily accessible to clinicians. Next slide, please. So the one source model is critical to complex trials like the new iSpy COVID trial. And the COVID trial has given us a unique opportunity to employ one source principles by using a standardized checklist of data in the ICU that captures critical health information for trials and clinical care. And as you can see, this allows us to send reports to the electronic health record system and clinicians who receive alerts for eligibility or outcomes. And this means that more time can be spent on providing quality clinical care. If we click once, we'll notice that a silver lining is that the COVID trial has also allowed us to fast track the implementation of the one source solution for breast care, which means that doctors and researchers will no longer be trapped in an inefficient system and patients will be able to travel along the continuum of breast care and easily interact with clinical trials should they. Thank you very much. All right, hi everybody. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so welcome to our Taste for the Cure cooking demonstration. Ali, can you turn your, can you turn your, uh, can you turn yours on? I'm on, I think they can see me. Okay, can we see you? Okay, awesome. Look, there's, Ali's in her chef's outfit. I am not in my chef's outfit. I'm in what I like to cook in, in the kitchen. I okay. may not have pajama bottoms on, but I look <laughs> on top. Perfect, perfect for COVID. All right, Ollie, what are we cooking today? So we're gonna do like, I heard you um, announce, we're gonna do kind of a fridge recipe because that's my jam and that's what I do. And one of the most leftover things in all of our kitchens are always grains and breads and things like that. So this recipe is sort of inspired by fried rice, but since it's almost my favorite holiday, we're gonna do it with more of a Thanksgiving twist. And it's got Brussels sprouts and mushrooms. We're gonna use nuts and dried cranberries. And then instead of like a soy based um, fried rice sauce, we're gonna do a balsamic dressing. So it's a warm rice salad with Brussels sprouts is wow, the type. That sounds, that sounds delicious. So Ali, tell us a little bit about um, what you do. Tell us what ends and stems are. I see that in the background. What is that? Um, ends and stems is my meal planning app. So it's a monthly subscription service. And the idea is that I will tell you what to cook. So relieve some of that burden. Um, I've cooked for, as you know, thousands of people for the and believe it or not, the number one thing people tell me that stresses them out is the deciding what to cook. It's most of the time not even actually cooking or going to the grocery store, but it's that decision piece. So Ends and Stems is a web app where you can go on and each week I will show you three recipes that fit together like a puzzle. So you can buy fewer items at the grocery store and then you'll make sure that you use them all up when you follow those recipes. And now that sounds- um, Box a week, so. That it's sounds, like, that sounds, that's a, how do people sign up for that? It's ends and stems.com. Okay, perfect. Okay. So Ali, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about, um, so I'm looking at the recipe. Those of you at home can take this and follow along at home. Yes. I was thinking that one of the things we might want to add is like a yellow or orange vegetable. One of the things that we, uh, that I learned about just yesterday at the Breast Cancer Research Foundation from Walter Willett and the nurse's health study is that yellow and orange vegetables, so things that contain carotene, actually have now been shown to really reduce the risk of breast cancer, um, especially triple negative breast cancer and recurrent or even the occurrence of it. And it's good for you and healthy for you. Mm -hmm. um, so can we maybe add a little yellow pepper? That sounds great. Um, what else could we add that might be yellow or orange? One of, the, one of the most basic things when they talk about cooking for nutrition is always just to eat the rainbow of vegetables, right? Because each color means that it has different nutrients and things in it. So that's really cool to hear about yellow and orange vegetables. Um, just, I mean, looking on my counter, I have acorn squash. This is orange inside, you know, it's in season right now. 
if you wanted to roast this ahead of time, it would be really great diced up and added in here as well. Um, quick cooking, you know, the rest of this recipe is very quick cooking. So the bell pepper is great. You can just dice that up and saute it when we do the shallot. Um, you could also do carrots. I would maybe grate them on a box grater. And then one of my favorite things ever in all ways is like the really orange sweet potatoes. They're called garnet yams. And those you could either dice and saute or you could roast them ahead of time. But the other really cool thing you can do with them is also grate it on a box grater. So you have kind of the strips of it. And then when you saute those, like this, yeah. Yeah, or the larger, like a cheese grater, the big holes. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Oh, okay. Making it so small then, when you saute it, it cooks really, really quickly. So you're taking something like, you know, a sweet potato you might think normally takes 20 to 30 minutes to cook, but by grating it, you're making it go really quickly. And that would taste amazing in this dish too. I like the combo of um, any of the squashes or sweet potato with the balsamic. Right, I'll get my box grater. And one of the things that I love, I learned this from Tracy Desjardins a long, long time ago at a at a taste for the cure of it. If you can just you can just slice your uh, yep. right along the corners just like this, right? And you have like instantly no way to you don't have to worry about the bottom at all. Okay. And that's the end of it. And then you can put it in your little uh you can should be composting everything. So, that last right. thing you did was key. So you got to make sure, you know, when you slice just down along the edges, sometimes you will have that little base. So you've got to do that fifth cut on the bottom there to make sure to take the base. I'm going to start with my shallot. Um, if you don't buy shallots regularly, it's not something you have, you could definitely use onion. Um, I love the taste of onions, but it is probably one of the more common things people tell me they don't want in their food. So you could definitely omit it. Onions? But, I love onions. All right. I love onion too. And depending on how much or how little you enjoy it, you could cut the onion larger or smaller. So if you cut it into really tiny pieces here, you're not really going to taste it at the end, but it just gives, you know, a lot of like, depth. Well, of it gives a lot of flavor and doesn't have to taste oniony. The more you kind of saute it, the less oniony. So yeah, it and tastes, it, right? It gives it depth and um, it gives it like a really savory taste. So I'm going to start. I have this really kind of large, heavy saute pan. So whatever you use for this, you just want to make sure it has a really solid bottom. And if you have taller sides, it will really help once we get all the rice in there as well. And this way, and you're just slicing them just like this, right? Just right. Yep. Yeah, I sliced mine. I'll do a close up here. I sliced mine just kind of into half moon rings like this. Okay. I'm pretty thick. And again, that's because I really do actually enjoy the taste of it and I like to see it in the final dish. We'll go ahead and dice it. So Laura, check out this trick. This is oh, what's that? Part filled with essentially garlic confit or, or olive oil poached garlic. So what happened was I had way too much garlic and it was starting to sprout and not look that great. So I spent about 10 minutes and I um, peeled all the cloves and put it in a little pot and covered it with olive oil and then just simmered it until they're all really, really soft. And oh, then great idea. You need to store this in the refrigerator. That's really, really important for. And will it, will it stay for a while? It will stay in the fridge for a month. So now every no, time so I, can, I can, I can hide it. And then, then you can just take one of those and use it in place of a, when it says ask for a garlic clove. Yep. So I've got garlic clove that's super easy to use and you get the oil as well. So you can pour the oil in. But the important thing is you, whenever you do garlic in olive oil, because of botulism, you have to keep it in the refrigerator. So no Okay, so now I have to chop my garlic clove because I didn't do that ahead of time, but that's okay. Yeah, so, so I- do you want me to mince it or just slice it? Just mince it, right? Mince it or slice it. I would say the garlic is the same as the shallot. If you really enjoy garlic and you don't mind biting into a piece of it, you don't have to worry about chopping it so small. Um, but if you okay. want to just build the flavor of the sauce and the rice, you can chop it more finely. So I actually, nothing is better than a great knife, right, Allie? You know that's my favorite thing, right? Yeah, mine too. A knife, I, I'm a surgeon. I really appreciate fine knives. Yeah. That's great. Um, it's, all about, it's all about the tools, right? The most important thing about caring for your knife is don't put it in the dishwasher. 
Don't throw it in the sink. When you're done using it, wash it by hand, dry it off. And then I store mine in a knife block. You can see that behind me over here. You can do uh, the magnets. I, you know, I have toddlers at home, so I don't prefer the magnets. It seems a little too easy access for tiny hands. <laughs> but um, if grownups live in your house, people I know love those magnet walls and they look pretty cool as well. You can also, I know you do at your house, you just have like a little sheath for it and you keep it in a I top do. drawer. But the important part is if you put it in the drawer, you have to put it in the sheath. And I know you're really good about that. Um, but I have been in other people's houses where they just have all their knives thrown in a drawer and it would just get dull really quickly. And um, I'm sure as a surgeon, you know, as well, if you cut yourself with a dull knife, it takes longer to heal, it hurts more and it's just not. Great so tip. I'm preparing my mushrooms and you're saying we should saute the mushrooms before the shallots? Will that make them wilt or get yucky? Yeah, you know, the mushrooms need a little while to really cook all the way through. I actually already put my shallot in and I'm just doing my mushroom now. So it doesn't matter too much which order. And, you're just, and we're just doing some big fat slices here, right? Big fat slices and I do it near the pan so I can throw it right in. You know, the most, the most important part is the way I write the recipe is to help people also learn some timing. So whether you do the mushrooms first or the shallot first, the main point is that you want to get started cooking while you're prepping the other ingredients. And while, and, while, and for those mushrooms, you just have to wipe them off, right? You don't have to put them in water so they go, don't, you don't want them to get soggy, right? Exactly, yeah, because they're like little sponges. If you wash them, I mean, sometimes you can run them under a little bit of water, but most of the time there's no reason to. It works better if you just do a slightly damp paper towel and you can just brush off any dirty parts. Um, but since mushrooms are like little sponges, if you soak them in water, they'll absorb water. And then when you go to saute them, they'll never get brown and crispy and they'll always just sort of be gray and soggy. It doesn't make for good mushrooms that way. So right. I have okay. now. All right, I'm, I'm sauteing my mushrooms. And then how much oil do we put in? Just a little bit enough to cover it? Whatever. Yeah, just enough to kind of coat it. Um, if you're really watching, um, you know, your your fats, you want to make sure to measure it and you can get away with probably about a teaspoon. And you could use coconut oil if that's better for your diet. Um, I know when I when I used to work with Greta from the, the Cancer Center Nutrition, you know, she always really wanted to measure how much olive oil we were putting in, just because when you're dumping it in you can get carried away too quickly and you you really don't need that much you just need enough to get things sizzling okay and now should i put and now i put the shallots and the garlic in yep just toss the whole thing right. in right right here okay and what about when what what's and wait wait for the don't put the 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 bell peppers in yet right i would wait on those a little bit Give Give the mushrooms and shallots a little bit of time. To All right, so what about these Brussels sprouts? What are we gonna do with these Brussels sprouts? How do oh. we prepare these? Okay, so I took off the end here. You can see just the bottom end. And I take off as little as possible. This is all I took off just because this end is dry. If you get these really fresh at the farmer's market, it, this part sometimes isn't even dry. Sometimes you can even keep it on. You don't even have to get rid of it. Now, my favorite part is as soon as you cut it, you get a couple of these beautiful leaves. And as long as they look great like these, you can eat these. No need to throw these away. My daughter actually won't eat a whole Brussels sprout, but if it's just the leaves, they get nice and crispy and she'll eat a whole pile of them. So sometimes I actually just chop off the ends and then pull all the leaves off the Brussels sprouts. And I just saute this pile of leaves like this with a little bit of garlic oil or butter and garlic salt and she'll just wow. eat a whole pile of them. Maybe even Michael will eat them. Maybe we oh, can yeah. try the toddler trick on Michael. Maybe we can do it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna try it. Yeah, so if you've got someone in your house that doesn't like Brussels sprouts, take these crispy little leaves yep. and put them up. But for this one, we're gonna, we're gonna make ribbons. So I've cut off the bottom. Now I'm gonna keep cutting perpendicular through this Brussels sprout. In so this perpendicular or the side? So Allie, can you show us? Yeah, so I went in here. If, it's, if you're holding it up right this way, I cut off the bottom yep. and then keep going up. So not, I'm sorry. Keep going up. Right, so it's, 
it's parallel to that main bottom cut. Okay. Happens. Okay, I did a bunch the other way, but that's okay. It's okay if you do it the other way. I told you incorrectly at first. What happens is you get these like this, and then you can pop off all the leaves. Yeah. And you get this kind of cool confetti. And this does two things. One, you know, as we get later and later into the fall season, Brussels sprouts tend to be like, especially in the past couple of years, they're having their moment of fame and they're so popular and you have them all the time. And you're probably constantly eating them roasted or just cut in half and seared. But this gives them a different taste and a different texture. So it's, I just like to switch it up a little bit. The second thing that it does is it makes them cook quickly. So if you have whole Brussels sprouts or Brussels sprouts that you just chop in half, you know, they're gonna take 25 minutes, sometimes even a little bit longer to cook. But when we're chopping them into ribbons like this, they actually cook really, really fast. Wow, so it's pretty easy. Very <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> if you've had a hard day, yeah. this is just a great thing to do. All right, so I'm gonna add- Stay my attention so you don't cut your fingers. Don't cut your fingers. All right. Okay, and then what do I, then do we add that to the, the Brussels sprouts to the, to the saute thing? Yep, I'm adding mine in. And, you know, you don't really have to go through, like this piece is still pretty large. I'm just gonna put it in like this. If you go through with your fingers, you can separate out all the pieces, but I'm okay with the bits being uh, different sizes. And you'll see at the end when we mix it in with the rice, that actually makes it interesting. Um, it makes it look different. It makes it taste, you know, fun to eat because you're getting different bites. Now, I'm also going to, um, I'm going to add a pinch of salt. I'm, what I'm cooking here in this pan is, is not quite the full recipe that I've written. So I'm just going to do a little pinch of salt. Oh, I'm, I, you're fooling me. I'm cooking, I'm cooking the full thing. You're doing the full thing. All right. I'm doing the full Monty. And you can see pretty quickly, my Brussels sprouts are already starting to get bright green. So they're going fast, which is awesome. Okay, well, I gotta uh, get the rest of mine. I got, I've got a lot of Brussels sprouts and it doesn't matter if you over, overfill your pan, does it? Nah. You, it'll cook more quickly if it's not overfilled because they'll have more surface area to touch the heat. So it might take a little bit longer. And when it's overfilled, they'll start to steam a little bit. So you'll get fewer brown crispy edges, but it will okay. still be great and it will still, you know, cook through, so you're fine. So I'm gonna okay. make a dressing here. Recently, I've been making dressings like this, um, maybe because I'm lazy, maybe because it's trendy, I don't know. But I'm gonna make okay, my- Okay, wait a second, I, 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 let's, let's, let's go. I have to make my dressing. Okay, so how, how do we do that now? I'm gonna do mine in a mason jar. So I'm just putting all the ingredients into this jar, but you can do it in a bowl with a whisk if you prefer. All right, I'll do that since I was gonna get a mason jar, but I'll do that since you're doing that, I'll do it mine the other way. Okay, there's my honey. All right, so what am I putting in here? You see this? Okay, so I've got um, balsamic vinegar. Okay. I put in a little bit of honey. Now, if you're not eating sugar, um, which from doing these, I think most of the time with cancer treatment, you don't wanna be consuming sugar. So you can absolutely omit that. But if that's not a concern, I use honey. And it's always fun to have fun utensils. Okay. And add a little bit of lemon zest. So lemon and Brussels sprouts, classic combination. It just brightens them up and it helps, um, it helps counteract the bitterness that acid in the lemon. So I'm gonna do just a little bit of lemon zest into here. Having a zester, it's a great cooking actually. One of the most fun things you can do is have lots of, lots of fun toys in your kitchen, right? I got a new zester recently and it's so very sharp and excellent. Okay, and I'm gonna- my zester. I'm gonna add my lemon juice into here as well. And then and one, of the, one of the fun, one of the fun, one of the fun things, the whole lemon or just part of the lemon? Um, I would add the whole lemon if you're making the whole recipe. But yeah, and this is, this is actually one of my favorite toys. I love kitchen gadgets. That's half the reason to cook. To have these great kitchen gadgets. And I know you like, love see lemon. This? See, no, see, see this, you've got a, this is like a, it's got a little strainer so you don't have, mm -hmm. right? So 
Uh, this this came from Denmark, from the Elam Bluehoot. That's awesome. I don't have one of those. I know, and don't take mine. <laughs> um, okay, then I added a little bit of Dijon. Um, mustard is great in vinaigrettes because it actually helps emulsify it. So it's, it's what will give you that nice um, smooth look at the end. And then- Just Like a teaspoon or so, or a little bit, something like that. Yeah. I'm gonna pour in a little more olive oil. Um, again, if you were watching the total amount, I would measure it all out at the beginning and save a little for the end. And then this is why the mason jar is so cool because that's it. Yeah, but you know what? What you can do is have all kinds of fun gadgets. Yet another reason to do things. See, I have my little egg whisker. And oh, I forgot I put a little bit of oil in there. There we go. The other cool okay. thing in a mason jar is and that- I'm, I'm mine's almost as fast as yours, Allie. But if I make it in a mason jar and I don't use it all up, I can actually just store it in the fridge this bowl to watch uh, to wash. And something like vinaigrettes, vinaigrettes are always one of the things that, you know, people buy them from the store, those bottled vinaigrettes, they're filled with junk, they're filled with stabilizers, they have so much growth. They have random added flavors that you can't even identify. But making a vinaigrette yourself in a jar like this, you can make this once a month, enjoy it in so many different ways. And it's one of the easiest things to make from scratch that for some reason, people are obsessed with buying in the grocery store. So whenever people ask like what they should be making from scratch, I don't think bread, like that's complicated and very skillful, but vinaigrette is so easy. You can make hundreds of varieties and, um, and it's way better for you in the end. And you can really control what's in it. And that would be a good time for me to add my little bell pepper, right? Yeah, you can get your bell pepper going on there. All right, so I'm gonna create like a little hole in the center of my pan. And to this. And what I'm are you, what are you, uh-huh. Now, this rice is day old rice as I put in the recipe. And what happens when rice sits in the fridge overnight is um, it dries out. So this is, you know, really where fried rice originated from anyway, is a way to use up old rice. When you make fresh rice, it's still, you know, really sticky and it's freshly steamed. And then when you try to cook it again, it can end up being really gunky and um, it's just too wet to pull it off. So day old grains are perfect for this. And then, you know, like I said at the beginning, the fact that grains are one of the most commonly wasted things at home, it's just a perfect way to use it up. So I've kind of- About, about three cups ish, something like that, right? Yeah, see how I've kind of pressed mine like this? Oh, in the middle? So yeah. I've got mine looks like this. Yeah, and you, what you wanna do is really just press it because we want the surface area of the hot pan. I'm gonna crank my pan up here too. Because we want to. Oh, get I have mine pretty cranked up. All right, I'll. Okay. We want to kind of get that crispy fried rice texture going on. And okay. I can start to sizzle. And I may, um, I may have. You, put, you haven't put your dressing in yet, have you? I have not. So I'm putting some more salt in, right? I put a little pinch. My rice is very undersalted, but it depends. Oh, yeah, I didn't. I mean, and I'm not. I'm using. Um, I'm using quinoa because I, that's what I made last night. So I just made a little extra. Perfect. So, you know what works perfectly for this? You could even use noodles. You could use um, you could use lentils. You could use really any grain you have left over. Okay, any great. Rice, I mean, brown rice would be amazing. Brown rice gets really nice and crispy, so I'm a fan of that. And you can hear it sizzling. So the reason I haven't added my dressing yet is because this rice is going to start to stick to the bottom as it crisps. And then when we add the dressing, it'll start to steam and it'll help release the rice so that you're not ending up with a big sticky mess on the bottom. So I'm gonna let this go for a little while. I can start to peek and see that it's picking up some nice brown color. And if you can, you maybe stir it once, but it is sticking a little here, which is good. But a little stir, you can see this. A little stir and then pat it all down again. And then pat it all down again. Now, if you had your vegetables in the pan and you didn't have a big enough pan, you could actually remove them to a bowl to wait on the side. That way you have the whole pan to do the rice if you needed to. I'm excited, I'm gonna have dinner made. Okay. Dinner, breakfast, this is my breakfast. 
Oh, we were going to do an egg too. So. Oh yeah, I need an egg. I have my little pan. I'll get an egg going on over here so we can. Um, can we just, we're going to just crack it over the top at the end, right? So I'm going to do a little fried egg on the side. But I'm just gonna put one on the top and yeah. yeah it would be very um you know that's how they do it on fried rice is actually to just do like scrambled eggs in with the rice. Are you but gonna I'm add it now? Fine. Are mom. you adding yours now, Alex? What's that? Are you adding yours now? I'm gonna do my egg on the side in another pan. Uh, but I can just drop mine in in the middle, right? Yeah, you can drop yours in in the middle. I, should I, and maybe should I make a little space in the middle? Yeah, make a little space in the middle. Perfect. Okay. Yep, and crack it right in. Okay. Awesome. Now the trick is that you don't want to stir it too much because if you stir it up too much, it's actually just going to coat the grains of quinoa, which actually tastes great and is a completely different cooking method. Um, but if you want to see the strings of egg in there, then don't I stir do. it too much. Okay, and then um, I should probably get some pepper. Always, always with the black pepper. I'm going to get ready to oh. add my dressing here. All right, wait a second. I got to add my pepper. Wait for me. Okay. And then, of course, a little more salt. <laughs> okay, so can I, so with this egg, should I then be kind of. Yeah, you can crack up the yolk. Just don't stir it too much. Okay. Here you go. Okay, here goes my dressing. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start with less because you can always add more and you'll hear it sizzle. I have to wait for my egg now. Oh, can you see that? Oh, I have, uh, I'm behind because I have to wait for my egg. And let's see if I can show you this. What that did, can you see that crispy brown rice? I can, I'm gonna, um. So what this did, because the pan is really hot, was it released the rice right off the bottom of my pan. So almost no part. Okay, now that I've got, hey, it's all I have put my egg in, now I can just kind of mix that up, right? And yep. then I should make, and then do I pour the, the dressing everywhere? I wouldn't pour it directly on the egg, but yeah, you can pour it everywhere. Just, just pour it all over the top? Yep. Start with less. You know, don't do it all at once. Oh, listen to it sizzle. I'm just putting yeah. it the rest. Of, mm -hmm. It sizzles and I can see nice crispy bits of rice. Here's a close up. Now it's, should I, and I have to wait for it to sizzle before I mix it, right? Yeah, wait for it to sizzle because that's the, that'll be the rice um, releasing from the bottom of the pan with all of that steam that's escaping when it sizzles. Wow, that mm, smells great. Yeah. And if no, you can I'm smell it, you know you don't have COVID. We're, we're going to move on to the fruit and the nuts. I'm going to do okay. raisins. Oh, you know, I don't have those. What else can I use? Um, you could use, obviously, regular raisins or currants. Dried cranberries was a suggestion on the recipe. Do you have anything? Okay, I don't have those. Let me see what I have in my book. Oh, how about these? I have um, dried cherries. Can I use those? Perfect. Check what size they are, and you might want to chop them up a little bit first. <laughs> are they a little bit bigger than a raisin? They'll be okay. Just you know like what? That. Yeah, I don't feel like chopping them. Can I just put them in? Absolutely. Okay, and now I can just, oh, look at that. Mmm. The cherries are going to taste really festive. I like that. Uh, so, so do I, and I keep this, I keep this stirring, right? Yep. You can keep stirring. And since you had more in your pan, you probably want to keep cooking it a little bit. I've actually turned the heat off my pan because it was done. Oh, there, and there's my egg. I have walnuts see, that I'm going to see, add. There's, there's the egg. Can people see that? Mm. So, All right. So I'm going to, I have, uh, I have some sliced, uh, I have some sliced almonds. Will that work? Sliced almonds, perfect. Yeah, I think that's what I wrote in the recipe. I love sliced almonds. I, I mean, I just love the taste of almonds, but also um, they're ready to and go. So I, and can I put the I, can I put the, the, the fruit directly in while it's cooking? Or do I wait till it's done? I wait until closer to the end. 
Um, you do want it to have the chance to wear through and it will, they'll plump up just a little bit. So my- Wow, pants, this is really yummy. That tastes like the balsamic. Wow, that's just fantastic. So I'm gonna add another little splash of dressing and my egg is done. All right. You're looking over there. It's really pretty good. So should I should I just let it crisp up just for a second? Yep. So yeah. mush it into the pan. Okay, and then get and then we're gonna get we're gonna put a little I got my box grater out. Perfect. My box grater. So should I get that? I can do that for my carrot, right? Yes, you're gonna add yellow and orange. Here's my finished before the Okay, end. I've got, this is gonna be for my garnish. You can see the bits of crispy rice and I just love that there's a variety of textures, flavors, colors. Um, you know, I love rice in general, but cooking the rice and cooking it with the sauce, that's a little bit unexpected because it's not a soy sauce, it's sauce based. Um, and it really reminds me kind of of a Thanksgiving-y feeling. Okay, there's my, see here's some nuts. And okay, that looks pretty good. Do the egg on top, let's see. How's that? I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna get rid of these, but wow. Oh, you did yours with the whole egg. I did mine in the middle. Yeah, you okay, did so it gonna... egg style. I like how you did it actually. I was thinking a whole egg on top, but either way, you know, whatever, whatever you like. Mine's all mixed in and then I can just mix this up and then put it family style and then put that garnish on top. Yep, that's right, parsley. We didn't and talk look, about it. Voila, uh, so I can do it family style and put it on a nice beautiful plate. I also noticed that I had green onions in my fridge this morning. Green onions would taste amazing. Oh, that would be that would be great in here. Where would you put those in right with a shallot? I actually kind of just like them raw on top, but it sort of depends on on your this is, on your taste. This is like a soufflé from a um, from a paella. If you like them cooked, you could do them with the shallots. Mm. A little, I got a little crispy on one. Got got a little crispy on one side, so we'll just get rid of that. And then um, you were gonna put parsley on yours, right? Yep, I sprinkled mine with parsley. You can see in my pan here where it really stuck to the bottom, but if you use a metal spoon, that all comes up and that's the best part. That's yep. nice. And here's this version. And so even, yep. though, even though this is a leftovers dish, the leftover leftovers would also be good. So if I had this in the fridge, I would just microwave it to eat, you know, second time. So, oh, I love it. It's really beautiful. Family style, delicious. And everybody, if you're at home and you're cooking along with us, a little bite. A little bite. Mmm. Cheers. Delicious. And we will see you all next year in the audience at Taste for the Cure. Normally, I cook for all of you and you get to try it. And I'm sorry that this I This is could something you can try at home. We just made it right today. This is actually, I had never made this before. We've never tried it and we did it just like that. So that's how easy it is. If you if you cook it and you're on Instagram, tag it ends in stems and that way I can see it. And nothing makes me happier than when folks cook my recipes and let me see them later. So I'm gonna not eat mine so I can take a picture so you can go on and find it. Um, okay. I know we're a little late, but I don't know if we had any questions or if we want to just do those after. I think we'll answer them in the in and later. We're running just a little bit late, but I want to make sure that we have a chance now to go on to our final presentation, which is from Nola Hilton, which is Taste for the Cure, and Nola, who's also a great cook. Um, and I'm going to let my hair down since I'm out of the kitchen. Um, anyway, uh, so Nola and I have been working together for gosh about 27 years. Nola, which you may not know, is really the re person who developed all the sequences and the software for what soon became breast MRI. So who better to explain to us what an MRI does, how it works, and how to advance the field. Her thesis actually is really all about how the sequences of MRI back in the late 80s, early mid 80s, turned this amazing new 
magnet into a way to help us interrogate the tissues of the body. So I'm going to turn to Nola, who's going to explain to us how we're going to, how, how uh, really what an MRI is, what a magnet is, and why we use it. Nola? Thank you. Thank you. That is just the absolutely most impossible thing to follow with an MRI lecture is that cooking demonstration. It looked fabulous and I'm starved. Um, and I am trying to put my video. Ah, there we go. Is it? It's on. Okay. So you can see it. Yeah, you can see me now. Great. Thanks everybody for hanging around for this. And I just, I'm going to go straight to slides. Um, here. Can you see? We can see you, Nola. Go okay. ahead and put it on. Okay. Go ahead and put it on. Yeah, slideshow. Yeah, right. we're good. Yeah. Um, you know, the panel was fantastic and your intern presentations were just so um wonderful to watch. Um, so and then I have to follow with the with the with uh salivating over that uh, rice. It looked wonderful. So I'll make it brief, and I really just wanted to show a little bit of um, a little background for MRI, just the most basics. And um, essentially, we, we're using MRI a lot these days to evaluate um, patients for breast cancer in the detection, in the diagnosis, in the staging setting. And the reason why, um, you know, MRI was not designed for breast cancer. MRI is a general purpose machine. It's used in many different um, body parts, and it is, it was, it's mainly um, when the technology is developed, it's, it's really focuses on the brain, um, and then other applications come out of that. So it is, it, it, in one way, it's a one size fits all system, but then we customize the methods we use for breast, uh, for breast evaluation. So basically what happens is there's an image um, performed and then there is a, as a patient, you're asked to stay very still and you're asked to, um, and it's noisy and I'll talk about that a little bit more and you're in a, a long tunnel tube machine, but essentially there are set of before and after pictures um, where um, in the middle there is an injection of a gadolinium contrast agent. So what we usually see is what's on the left, um, and this is someone who is um, in the process of being treated for their cancer. And what you can see is it's really just two shades of gray, nothing really um, standing out there. You do see that small little area where there's a biopsy clip, and then there's the injection of contrast, and then you see the area that gets bright there. So um, one of the things, one of the um, things that um, MRI brings, shows, uh, not unlike ultrasound um, can show heterogeneity, as can mammography. These are the kinds of images we see with um, MRI. And, you know, just like with all, um, all of the science of um, medicine, there is um, the, the individual um, uh, the heterogeneity of um, everything, and here heterogeneity of breast cancers. This is how we see them on MRI, and so where there's a, several things to appreciate. This is each showing four examples um, for patients with cancers in in their breast, and what I would point out is everything is different in each of these. You can of the underlying breast tissue. Um, different patterns of where and how the cancer arises and what it looks like on the images. And if you can imagine that this is just looking at one cross section, but if you moved through to the left and to the right of that, you could, you would see even more features. So, and radiologists um, and learn to look at these and understand what these, what's the heterogeneity there. So I would want to also mention that mammography and MRI, these are reflecting two very different properties. So a mammogram is essentially x-rays passing through tissue um, and they see patterns within tissue. And one of the things they see, um, it, mammography sees well, um, are microcalcifications. And since those can be byproducts of a, of a disease that's um, starting in the breast, these can be signs that there's something there. And that's, that's one of the things, just one of the things that uh, 
are appreciated on mammography. Those will not be seen on MRI. MRI will not see calcifications, but it's looking at something very different. So on the MR, this is, this is the same patient, and this is what was seen on this patient's mammogram, and this is a little um, zoom into the area where there are, and I believe there's, um, the calcifications are shown here magnified. The patient did have Paget's disease of the nipple and there was an underlying DCIS. And so the pattern here now is, is something very different. And what MRI is sensitive to really is what the, the vascular properties, how, how the blood flow is happening in the tissue. And that's what we're really picking up there. So that seems, it seems as though it would um, be a, a fantastic tool as it is for trying to see breast cancer. But the major um, difficulty and the challenge with breast MRI is that the normal tissue will also enhance. And it can do that to different degrees. It can do that um, differently um, between different individuals. It can also do that differently according to where um, a woman is in her menstrual cycle and other normal physio you know, physiologic conditions. So this, there, this particular pattern though became very apparent that there was this, not everything that um, was bright was necessarily a cancer. Um, so this is a, a phenomenon that's called background parenchymal enhancement. It can happen, it, again, it will have its own um, heterogeneity of appearance. Um, and one of the, the real challenges is that if in someone who has high BPE, and maybe, and no cancer, um, it's hard to tell, to rule it out. And on the other hand, for someone with high BPE, if there were a small developing cancer against that background, it might be masking it. So it's really one of these challenges. We're also looking at, at it as one of um, something, uh, um, a property that reflects the basic, um, the basic underlying condition of the breast tissue. So this is how is breast MRI performed? It's done as I mentioned with a standard general MRI scanner. You see the scanner in the back and it uses what's called a breast coil or breast radio frequency coil. And MRI, um, in MRI for the body part that's being studied, there will be a coil that's specifically designed to focus in on that area. Um, and it has to, um, one, support the patient. It has to also, in this case, um, we need patients to be in the prone position um, and on the table, and then the table slides back into the magnet. And the images then that come out are these types of images that I've been showing. But I wanna just say a, a little bit because the why, um, you know, it, it's not a easy exam. Um, MRIs are not pleasant necessarily to have. And if any of you and those of you who've been in an MRI machine know that it can be very loud and you're in this long tube. So the, the system itself below all of the external plastic has a lot of um, electronics in, it, within. And one of the, to really make good pictures, this really needs to be long so that the magnetic field inside is pretty stable and homogenous. Then there are other pieces that are doing other things called gradient coils. And then there's this other, what I mentioned before, which is the, the anatomic coil for the particular exam. So a breast coil or a head coil. And that's really what it is, is an antenna. So signals are getting generated in this entire space. Um, uh, the receiver is picking up those signals. It's actually a big jumble of measure, you know, signals that, uh, again, like an antenna, it's picking up. And then there's a process by which that is interpreted into its picture. So that's what's happening. And if we make this smaller in length, if we make it wider in the circumference here, all of those things will compromise the quality of the image that comes out. So it really is... Um, it's a, it's a design, um, it's trying to maximize the performance of MRI, um, but not you know, keep it as uh, bearable as possible and as, as accessible. So um, in this program, we're using MRI quite a bit for measuring treatment response, and you've been hearing a lot about that. And because of the things that I was showing at the beginning, that MRI really is a very sensitive test to measure 
the size, the, the location, um, the distribution of the breast cancer, um, it's also then a very good way to try to track what's happening as a, during treatment. So we use this um, in the iSpy2 trial. Um, and we have very highly prescribed time points at which we obtain the MRI. So there's an MRI that's um, obtained before treatment starts. Um, after about, it's about three weeks. Um, if, if it weekly cycles, then it's about three cycles of treatment. Um, after 12, and then usually there's a change in the particular drug that's being administered. Um, and then there's another one um, performed right before surgery. And so you can see there is a gradual response pattern here, um, and there still is some residual enhancement. So um, this is not, I, I just want to mentioned that um, as with the bio, biomarkers that we heard about earlier from the panel um, and with MRIs that are being performed at multiple times during treatment for each patient, then there's mu 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 a lot of data and it shows a lot of heterogeneity that we want to try to understand and make sense of and see if these patterns are meaningful in terms of telling, as, in terms of telling us about the patient and telling us about the effectiveness of the particular um, treatment that the patient is receiving. And so in my lab, um, there is a lot of work to take this set of images, one, to make sure they're done right in the first place and make sure they're very consistent and good quality, then to convert them into measurements. And the measurements are things that look at the size of the tumor, look at how the tumor is distributed in the breast. Um, and then looking at this phenomenon that I mentioned, the background parenchymal enhancement. And to measure that, what we do is we look in the other breast, in the, the non-symptomatic breast to try to get a, a measurement of the BPE. And then we put, there's a lot of work to look at what that means. And then we are trying to say, if, if we know that not only it's it is the size important, but the distribution is important. And perhaps this BPE in and of itself is meaningful. Then can we put these all together and learn more about the patient? And what we're finding is, is that we do get a better ability to uh, predict who's on a pathway to a good response by doing that. So in iSpy now, we're very much focused on um, a strategy that will help us to um, make a decision about is the anthracycline um, phase of the treatment really necessary if someone has had a you know, really exceptional response at the 12-week time point, is it possible that um, the toxicity of the anthracycline can be avoided and the patient can go directly to surgery? So we're looking at this in a very prescribed way, and I believe you heard more about that last week and some today. And we follow again what's changing in the MRI, and we make a measurement. It's not as simple as saying, "Do we see anything there?" But it is a it's a it's a it's a prediction of is it likely there's anything left here based on what we've learned in a, the first thousand patients that we have that have enrolled in ICE by two, and for whom we have data, and that we can look back and learn that if of a certain subtype what's the likelihood that this pattern now at 12 weeks represents no disease left? So it's a little, little complicated, but again, it's based on a lot of knowledge that we're learning, things that we, we're learning in the trial, and we make a prediction, and we then um, also confirm that or look with a tumor bed biopsy to try to understand, is it truly um, a, a full absence of disease? And in, in using a very high standard for that, um, then, we, um, then it's possible that the patient and um, treating physician can recommend to skip AC and go directly to surgery. So that is, that's a program in a nutshell. And I would say, again, you know, understanding that um, MRIs are not so simple and multiple of them are really um, impose a lot on, on patients to have to um, endure during the course of their treatment. And there are things that are happening now on the technology side that will hopefully speed them up and also um, try to identify, we're trying to identify methods that would not require the injection of gadolinium contrast. So I have a huge lab um, of people who work on this every day, day in, day out. Um, and I show them here and uh, 
um, point out in particular Jessica Gibbs, who, who really communicates with all of many patients and uh, investigators at many sites. Um, okay, so that is it. Um, well, no, Nola, I just before before you leave us, we just have a couple quick questions. So all those things that you talked about background back, you know, the the background and the what we call BPE, the base, the background um, enhancement. Uh, those are things that as we learn more about that, that really helps train radiologists to do a better job of interpreting, right? Even sure, yeah. and and when we talk about can we train them better to find lobular cancer. You know, it's really not just about the training, it's about tuning up the technology, right? Then that's what your lab works on. One other thing is that another question that was asked is, is BPE the same as breast density? Mm -hmm. Which is not, correct? It's not, it's not. And so one, it's not because it is, um, it is what happens when the contrast goes into the tissue. So what the BPE is saying is, what, what's the nature of the tissue? How vascularized is it? And is that a normal pattern of being vascularized? And that really is independent of how much tissue is there, which is the density. And in some studies where there are now enough, um, um, there's enough data in populations to look across populations and ask, um, do, are there, you know, density is uh, known to be, um, associated with risk. BPE is also suggesting that it's associated with risk and independent of the density. So there's a num number of pieces of information um, just as a the basic property, they're not the same. They're not the same thing. Um, and, and also the risk association is different. And, and but the good news is that you can measure it and you can measure whether it goes away. And probably easier to measure breast density and BPE on an MRI because as you've shown, it's a very quantitative tool. So in the background is all this, what we call artificial intelligence or AI. I mean, Nola's the queen of AI, we just don't call it that, but it is, that, and, and spoiler alert, maybe this is one of the keys for us for figuring out how to lower risk and how to really make prevention into a science where we can drive new concepts forward in the people at highest risk, combining the wisdom study, what we've learned in iSpy, and all that you've learned in MR. I think that's an exciting possibility, don't you, Nola? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I, you know, again, we wish we could rush to answers and especially be able to me. say, yeah, especially <laughs> you, especially you. Um, but, you know, it really, uh, you know, again, we come back and we thank patients for enrolling in trials. And um, I think it's this, the more um, data that we're able to look at, because even when we say something like, well, do lobulars look different than invasive cancers? The short answer is yes. But then even amongst lobular cancers, they present looking so differently in imaging as in every other venue. So until, as we see more and more, we're able to pin down maybe features that are very more precise, so. That's right. And so many of you have been part of our clinical studies and we thank you so much. I hope you realize just how much your participation means to moving the field forward and making the options better and making sure that tomorrow we can do things better than today. Nola, thank you so much. That was just perfect. And I don't know about you, but I oh. like, <laughs> my plate. I had That's just my so well. last plate. Mm. <laughs> so delicious. It was really fun. Really, I'd never made that before. It was so easy. I loved it. And actually you could be cooking it while you were, I mean, while you were <laughs> chopping and preparing. So that's really a fun thing. So just letting everybody know that in the, we're going to have information about nutrition at the site. And remember the yellow and orange vegetables are things to make sure you add, but every vegetable as, 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 uh, as our, as Greta McCare and, and, um, Ali Montfort say, eat the colors of the rainbow. That's the kind of thing, a Mediterranean diet is the thing that's gonna be best associated with, with good health overall and reduce your breast health and reduce your chance of recurrence. So we hope that today you've really enjoyed a taste of science, a taste for the cure, um, and that, uh, that you've enjoyed your time with us. We will make sure that all of this is available on our website. We'll look at any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer and we'll put up some of those uh, answers 
uh, for you. We'll ask our breast surgery fellows, um, uh, Teresa Chan and Rachel Yang to help us answer some of those questions for us. And we just wanted to let you know that we now have breast imaging services available in the East Bay. These are UCSF services. We're trying to make sure that people can get services across the Bay Area, but are absolutely part of our program. So when you call in, you can just let us know uh, if you wanna get your imaging there. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And again, I want to thank um, all of our interns. Uh, these guys did a fantastic job of distilling down really complicated topics into a three minute presentation. And I know I really enjoyed it. I hope all of you did too, which is great. And I especially want to thank Melinda Walker and um, Samia, um, uh, and, and, and Samia Umashankar for all the hard work of putting this together. This is the pictures of the two of them uh, working hard this morning to bring this to, to you seamlessly. You guys did a fantastic job of corralling everybody. Um, so um, uh, 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 thank you. Um, and, um, um, and so um, anyway, if you, thank you for joining us and you can go to uh, www.cancer.ucsf.edu, Taste for the Cure. You can download the resource handout, a recording of the event, and the slides from today. You can watch last week's event recording, and by Monday, you'll be able to see this week's recording. And uh, we're going to uh, do a good job of planning for, for, uh, for next week. Again, thank you so much for spending your Saturday with us. Uh, a taste for the cure. We definitely have a taste for the cure. We can see it on the horizon and we're moving as fast as we can to bring it here first for you. And remember, science and clinical trials and studies are what propels all of us forward. Better, better um, outcomes and better options for you today, tomorrow, and for your children, your friends, and your family. Thanks again for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you. Happy Saturday, everybody.